Hello, and welcome to the recording. Today we're going to talk about a little bit of our X509 uh, fuzzer progress and make some improvements to our fuzzing tool. So, uh, basically what we did in the past two streams, or one stream, can't remember if it was one stream or two streams, um, we effectively uh, started working on fuzzing an ASN1 target. The target that we actually ended up landing on was some random thing that we found on GitHub uh, called Asinine. So if we go on to uh, GitHub and we search for Asinine, hopefully we can find it. I don't remember who the author was of this. Uh, where's my search? Where's my search button? There it is. That's... Totally not what I wanted. Uh, I forgot, I have a different clipboard set up on this system. Yeah, LMB or IMB, I think it's LMB slash S9 is kind of the X509 parser we were looking at. We picked this because it's just a random parser, doesn't have too many stars or forks, so I can't imagine it's used in too many places. And uh, it's relatively easy to build. We were able to recompile it for uh, RISC-V, which then allows us to load that up in our emulator such that we can fuzz it. And that's what we did. We went through a couple different iterations of a fuzzer. Uh, basically, here you're seeing the um, number of fuzz cases on the x-axis, and the y-axis is number of, uh, the amount of unique coverage. Basically, uh, this is allowing me to kind of compare uh, different fuzzers with each other. So in this case, we've got um, like this. Uh, the worst line here is with no corpus and no dictionary. Basically, just expecting the fuzzer to magically create inputs out of thin air. Obviously, it performs quite poorly. <clears throat> we have one that we have no corpus, but we have an OID dictionary. So here, we never teach the fuzzer what a valid input looks like, but we give it a dictionary so it knows like some magic values to put in the file. And it makes a lot more progress, but it still is quite a bit behind. Uh, then we have uh, this line right here, which is a single input in the corpus. We put a one X509 in a corpus and load it up and continue fuzzing uh, from that point, basically flipping random bytes in it to see what they do. <clears throat> of course, everything here is a coverage guided fuzzer. We have no, uh, all of these things are doing feedback. If they didn't have feedback, it we'd just have like a flat line at the bottom part of the graph. But I hope it's not weird that that's just implied. Um, and then in the yellow line, we have a single input corpus with an OID dictionary, which is kind of that dictionary of magic values plus an existing input so it knows roughly the correct shape. Um, and that performs, of course, better. No surprise there because it just gets a little bit further than the baseline uh, when we don't have a dictionary because some of those OID values do actually affect uh, the coverage and they weren't in the existing... Um, they weren't in the existing uh, input. And then we have the current and the last lines up here. This is just allowing me to run, like, the uh, compare the last case, uh, or the last run of the fuzzer with the uh, current run of the fuzzer. Uh, current is in purple or blue or whatever color this is. Um, and effectively, this allows me to see if the thing that I changed has improved it. And basically, in this case, we don't have labels because we are in the process of improving our fuzzer. Um, and the line at the top here with an astronomical amount of coverage compared to the other shitty lines is literally just a better corpus. We grabbed the uh, corpus of ASN1s or maybe X509s from OpenSSL. Or maybe both. I can't remember. Um, but effectively... Uh, it just shows kind of the progression that we've made of this fuzzer over time. Now, we actually haven't found any bugs with this, and I'm not too surprised um, because as we've dug into this code, we found that the code quality is actually really good. Um, I've been very impressed with the code quality uh, that we've seen, and thus I'm not, uh, I'm not super surprised uh, that we haven't seen a bug yet. Um, the code is relatively defensive, and when I say defensive, I basically mean that the code uh, is written in a way that makes it difficult to introduce a bug. Um, they do this via using a bunch of functions and macros to operate on the underlying data that they're parsing, and those functions and macros use the length internally. Um, compared to a lot of deserialization libraries that I typically observe and see, um, this one's a lot better in that they use kind of centralized uh, reading and writing techniques uh, that actually use the length compared to a lot of serialization and deserialization uh, 
that will often completely re-implement it every single time they need to deserialize a new byte. Um, typically, if they do like star pointer plus plus, right? If DRF pointer plus plus, um, and then they like decrement the length manually, uh, you'll see a lot of parsers that are written using a model like that. And it leads to a situation where you basically need to get the length check correct in a thousand different places rather than in one place. Uh, so a defensive way to kind of avoid having a lot of these bugs is making sure that you use helpers uh, every time you parse something. Basically, get rid of code duplication, which means if you have a, one bug, um, it likely will show up because it would be everywhere in your code that you use it. Uh, like, if you have an off by one in your deserialization uh, that is reading a byte from the input, and you use that everywhere in your code base, that will very quickly show up. Like, eventually it will cause even not a crash, but just a real usability issue to cause it to get fixed. Uh, but if you hand roll these things all over your code base, some lesser common uh, code path very frequently will just become stale, and you'll never know that you had a bug there because you maybe have never even tested uh, that path of the code. So... Anyways, that's kind of a little bit of the progress of where we were on the fuzzer side of things. But now we're working on what I call like a bespoke fuzzer, which is, or a bespoke mutator in this case to be specific, um, which is effectively allowing us to uh, modify and mutate these ASN1 files while maintaining the correct structure of them. Uh, it's really important to understand that ASN1... Um, basically is a nested structure. And that means that you can have a, a length in a length in a length. And if you modify or mutate one of the internal lengths and don't update the external lengths, very quickly you will not make any progress in creating new inputs. Um, just because the first length will cause you to not read enough that will cause a parsing failure on the object you actually wanted to insert into the stream. Um, so what we've done is we've written a deserialization library for ASN1, according to the X690-0207 spec. Um, I think it's just X690 is the uh, ITUT spec. Um, and we've written it in a way that we preserve the uh, encoding information of the input file. So ASN1s, of course, can have multiple different encodings. Uh, there's a lot of variable length ints and variable length lengths. Uh, they kind of resemble like UTF-8 encoding where if the top bit is set or a certain bit is set, the integer continues on the next byte and so on and so forth. So it's that actually makes it so there are multiple different ways of encoding the same thing uh, in ASN1. You can encode something with a one byte length or a two byte length or a 50 byte length. It doesn't matter. You can have redundant zero padding and stuff. Um, the spec says you shouldn't have those things and you're not supposed to have those things, but that doesn't mean those don't exist, right? Um, we are writing something that is meant to work with hostile data and it's meant to stretch the, the wording and the basically what we expect parsers to do. So while we're not implementing something directly to the spec, we want something that can uh, basically express the entire spec as a subset, and that means that we have a superset of the spec, which means we have additional features, additional encoding things, where we, we can encode like a, a fixed length thing inside of a dynamic length thing, which makes no sense, because there's no reason to ever encode something like that, um, but it allows us to do that, or vice versa. There, there's, there's so many different kind of designs that, that we can uh, go by here. Um... And that's kind of what we're working on. So, yeah. So, you're running a Risk Five emulator? Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Isn't that extremely inefficient on this actual hardware uh, as a different architecture? Not really. Um, I've got a, a super high performance uh, emulator that kind of makes it mm, sometimes faster than x86. So, let's see. Uh, is it using a mechanism like JIT? Yes, it, it, it JITs the instructions. So, starting a process billions of times a second on Linux is almost impossible because the kernel takes so much time. Yeah. So, 
Made it during fuzzing week where he uh, did a bunch of educational projects. Nope, that's actually not the Risk Five emulator we're using. But we did make a Risk Five emulator on stream, but we're using a different one. Um, the one that I'm using, I, I haven't, I didn't develop on stream. <clears throat> but yeah, it, it is probably a little bit slower um, than native x86. It's it's hard to extrapolate because I don't know how much we're hitting uh, memory versus L2 versus L3 versus L1. Uh, but we're emulating 60 billion instructions per second. That number is going to be climbing because we're averaging. Actually, the last run uh, will be nice and average it out. So we're emulating about 65 billion instructions a second. We're on, we're on a 96-core machine. Um, so that comes out to uh, basically uh, actually the inverse of that. About 670 million instructions a second is what we're emulating, uh, which is pretty good. So, uh, basically, on, on native x86, you'd probably end up getting, eh, it's hard to say, between like 5 and 10 billion instructions a second on a core. And we're getting uh, about 600 or, or 700 million a second. So, we're running probably in the ballpark of 6 to 10 times slower than native execution. Um, which is really not that bad. And that's mainly because uh, we have a lot of divergence where we're causing a lot of these cases to do different things. So if I were to go into here and make it so I don't mutate these uh, inputs, such that all of the VMs get the exact same input and don't get modified or mutated, um, uh, which would be... Oh, we don't have code open. Soft serve RV64... Um, we won't have nearly as much thrashing here, and I need color columns as well in my Vim, so I gotta add that to my VimRC. Uh, let's get rid of this. Don't adjust the input size, don't corrupt the input, uh, just set the permissions and go. And we'll see what we're getting now. Okay. Yeah, now we're getting about 75 billion a second. Actually, I think we're just hitting a lot of RAM. I think we're literally just hitting a lot of RAM. So this would actually be pretty comparable to native execution. Because um, the, uh, the JIT itself can easily do much more than that. Um, so... Hmm... Yeah, let's actually, I'm going to do a quick benchmark of, I'm going to do a really quick benchmark of the, um, of the JIT. And to do that, we need to make a, a test program. I, I just want to do this because I actually haven't done this in a bit. And I'm curious if I've uh, broken performance of something. Oh, you know what? It's, yeah, that actually makes sense. I've got uh, a couple like debug things going, or not debug things, uh, fuzzing things going. Okay. Uh... Holy shit, it's windy. Um. Ah, we want to go into folk, il, source, il graph, mod, and then we're going to take a look at the reg prop, and we're going to enable that optimization pass. Um, and then in the JIT, we're going to turn off... Oh, boy, I don't even have that as a configurable right now. Let's see... Uh, 305? Oh, 5. 405. Okay. So, this. If. Um. What do we want to call this? Uh. Reg coverage. Eh. Yeah. 
Okay, I can't reg. Here we go. And then we can do const register coverage bool is equal to false. Um, if set uh, registers which are known to be affected by the user input will be um, reported as coverage for both register reads and writes. And we can disable code coverage as well. So we'll just really kind of cut down some of those uh, overheads and we'll see what we're getting on perf now. Um, yeah. So now we're getting uh, 150 billion instructions a second. That's going to be climbing a bit. So let's see here. It'll probably climb to 180 would be my guess, which would be uh, we're emulating about uh, 1.9 billion instructions a second, which is about half the speed of native execution. Maybe a little bit more than half. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's basically a third the speed. It's somewhere between a third and a, and a half uh, for that performance, which I am really happy about. Um, and that's also doing a lot of memory accesses. So if we make an example just for funsies, um, we can do this actually in this uh, benchmark.c int main void. And then we're going to just make a loop. Um, what is the input? What is the name of this function? Let's see. What's the address and attach link? That's not ASN. That's ASAN. ASN is abstract syntax notation, uh, which is a file format or a serialization format more specifically. Um, okay, so we want to make a function called dump certificates. Um, uh, and we're just going to discard the input. We're not actually going to use it. And then we're going to do some assembly. Um, and I always forget the syntax in C for inline assembly, but hopefully we can make this work. We're going to do a move into uh, T0 of a billion. Loop, uh, we'll just do one, and then we'll do uh, sub t0, t0, one, branch if not equal to zero to one behind. I don't know. I, I feel like that's probably ballpark what we want to do. Uh, clang, targets, risk v64, unknown, Linux, GNU, c test. Uh, oops, benchmark.c. Um, And we're going to see if we can get this to link. It's going to be a pain in the ass, but I think we'll be able to get it to work. We're just going to hack this up really fast. Unsign long in this case. And... Uh, is it the semis? Is it MV? We have a load immediate, but I don't think that allows for a big one, a uh, big immediate there. Oh, do I have to do this too? What? <laughs> um. I don't have to say dollar signs for registers, do I? No. What? What? Um, D 
dot out. Let's just get an example. Li. That's load word. Li. Load immediate. Yeah, I should be able to do that. Uh, let's just do A4 just for funsies. Maybe it. Maybe they don't have the uh, pound. No? What the fuck? I'm just gonna comment this out. I'm actually really confused. Okay. Uh. Is it that semi? I mean, I can throw new lines in here, but I don't think. The inline assembly syntax is just always so f fucking scuffed, man. Uh, A484. Yeah, what the fuck, man? Like, it doesn't like the sub. Oh, is sub not an instruction? No, I don't think... I think it is. Let's see if we can get some basic risk 5. I swear sub is... A oh, it's add, sorry. Add immediate negative one. Ah, uh, okay, okay. So we had it. We had it going okay from the start. Um, branch if not equal to zero to, I guess one. Damn it! Let's just name it. Let's just try it. Fuck. Oh my god, I fucking hate this syntax, man. It's so bad. Holy shit. What the fuck, man? Does it not have binas? It, sh it should have branch if not equal to zero, but I can say like branch if not equal. Oh yeah, yeah, I was wrong. Okay, I'm being an idiot. There we go. Um, D on uh, benchmark dot O. Can I actually load that? Mm, no, I'm not going to be able to load that. Okay, so uh, let's see if we can get this to compile. And we'll just do... Uh, oh, hopefully we have LLD. Oh, do I not have LOD? What? Really? And that's for LVM linking. Ah, damn it. That's a fucking rip. Um, am I going to have anything that can link that? Uh, Rush should be able to link it. Let's try this. Uh, let's 
do target is equal to risk v64 um gc unknown linux genu <laughs> we could have just done this in uh, Rust, couldn't we have? Hell yeah. No standard. No mangle. Start. No main. Um, do I even need start? Panic handler and foo. Okay, let's uh let's figure that out. It takes a uh, one arg, which is this bank. Interesting. Oh yeah. Um cargo.toml profile release panic is abort. And that should get rid of that requirement. And this should maybe make a binary. And then we can do Rust uh stuff. Oh, we need a uh I see. It's expecting some libc stuff. Hmm. Why though? Oh yeah, I'd have to install that toolchain. I see. Okay, let's go grab a uh, um let's go grab that quick. Uh, we're definitely on a tangent, but this is fine. We need this anyways. So we'll go and find this. Mm. Where is it? Here we go. Bank. Uh, and then we want to, I need to figure out what flags I want to use. We'll just move that to here. Oh, I got to do that recursive. Yoink. I was about to say that, that was way faster than it should have been. Prereqs, I think we should hopefully be fine. And I've had problems with using opt where it's not correctly showing up in the, uh, it's not correctly, it's not building if I do the opt prefix. So we'll see. I really don't want to clobber a user uh, with it, but I might have to because I think there's a problem in the build process where I'm unable to build. Technically, I have this set up on Grizzly. I probably should just use uh, Grizzly quick. Uh, come on. But I think we'll want this locally eventually. Um, oh, then add this to your path now. Oh, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the problem. Because if I can put it, in, put it in opt, I'll be very happy. Holy shit, this checkout. This is slow as shit, man. 
Ginger, hell yeah, we got some ginger going. Ginger live in the studio. This song is fantastic. Be more Gen 2-ish, yeah. So I've had this problem before and it, it literally fails to build if I don't have it in the default uh, prefix, but it's probably because I didn't have this path set up. There's some great reactions to your voice on YouTube. Yeah, I've, I've, I've seen those. I've gone down that rabbit hole and then I also kind of, I kind of find it funny that it's always like the same shit going into, into the reaction channels. They're, they're a little cookie cutter. <laughs> I watched a couple of them and I'm like, holy shit, it's the same thing over and over. That being said, I watched a lot of uh, reactions to like Nightwish. Oh my god, Taria, holy shit, dude. Um, the, the whole, uh, what was it? I forget what festival it was in like 2003 or 2004. Um, was it in Oslo? I can't remember. There's a fan fucking tastic live performance by Nightwish. They did like all their core songs. I think they were on Century Child at the time. So they did like Phantom of the Opera, uh, Century Child, couple, a couple of different songs. Like, holy shit, that whole concert is just legendary. It's dangerous. <laughs> Watch that. I'm, I'm down. Guy watches Meshuggah for the first time. So, like, there are some good reaction channels, but I've found that, like, they're few and far between. There are some really good ones, though, for sure. Come on. God, this takes so long. I feel like it didn't take this long before, but maybe they added shit to this. Should they cross dev to set up the target? I mean, I can try it. I kind of suspect it's, it's I, yeah, that's definitely not going to work. That's not going to let me control, uh, it's not going to let me control the, um, I mean, maybe it does if I find some way to do it, but I'd rather have the control here and build it. You can give it a tuple. How do I give it compiler? How do I give it flags? And I don't know if I can. Eh, there's got to be a way to set C flags. Um. I don't see a great way to provide flags to it. User target Etsy portage. Okay. And then portage config root. User that. This looks pretty neat. I, I might I might try to set this up, but Holy shit, can I like fully cross build Gentoo? Um
Okay, user target Etsy portage. So is that really what I need to do? So I need to put it there. All right, let's try it. I don't need just a linker. I need I need more. Um I need a eventually I'll need a full to tool chain. Like right now I only need a linker, but I will need a full tool tool chain, so I'd prefer to do that. Let's see uh cross dev. Use latest stable versions. Overlays. Hmm. Arc vendor. Okay. Risk V sixty four. Yeah, I would need to set up the C flags, and I don't know if it will build it correctly. That's something I'll look into later. Uh, I'm not going to waste my time with it right now. Okay, so we'll do a configure uh, or export. It is raining fucking sticks off of trees right now. Uh, we're going to do... I won't be able to do that. Um, I wish it was raining here. Yeah. It's been nothing but raining here for a while. Okay. Uh, exports path is path opt risk v bin okay looks good i should have prepended it yeah we're gonna prepend it i don't really care too much we'll just do that for now that's better okay so we'll do a uh, configure prefix opt Risk V with arc is RV sixty four um M uh I A M or I M A is is typically what people say. I M A with A B I uh L P sixty four RV64 IMA, that should be fine. Okay. Oh yeah, this is this machine doesn't have many cores. I haven't heard this song or a cover in it in a long time. Oh yeah. Fucking AFI, dude. Th this whole album is fantastic. Um one of the few albums that you can just listen to the whole thing. Just serial. Like Song by song, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Now we're just building stuff. <laughs> but this is good. We, we, wanna, we want a full tool chain here. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to tell Rust to use this. I guess if it's in my path, it might just try to. I'm not 100% sure. Because I know Rust will search for, like, user slash target slash whatever. Um, I don't know if it will work if it's just in your path. Hopefully it will. We'll see. I'd love to get it. I'd love to get Rust building uh, Risk V. That'd be kind of cool. 
I don't think I've done that yet, have I? Sounds kind of fun. It just works with cross dev? Yeah, but I'd have to go and figure out all the config stuff. Because if you just started toying with Rust, hell yeah. Sounds like a sounds like a good project. I don't know. Getting this setup would be neat, but you just literally make like a new Etsy portage. User arc Etsy portage, and then you can do architecture and C flags, it looks like. And hopefully, it would use those C flags when building. Um, I don't know, I'm kind of concerned it, it. Hmm. GNs. I don't know how I haven't lost power yet. Uh, that has to be like a 50 mile an hour gust right now. The trees are at like fucking 45 degree angles. It's a raining fucking like tree limbs right now. <laughs> We're surviving. Yeah, I don't know if it would use these C flags when making the compiler. I would maybe assume that it does. I don't know. I don't see anything here. No, I don't think it does. I... Hmm. Cross dev config. Local repo, cross dev. Oh, run LTO dump. This is the slow part. <laughs> it takes so long to link this fucking binary. It's like one of the slowest parts of the build. I think there's two of these. So. Portage config root, yeah. Hmm. I guess, yeah, that would probably rebuild the tool chain based on those flags. We, we probably could get this to work. We would have to set up the Etsy portage make, uh, like user target Etsy portage make, and we could probably get it to work. I'm just going with what we know for now. This is probably something I'll play around with off stream. But yeah, then you'll set that and then you'll probably have to rebuild system. Um, creates all that after you ask for a tool chain. We can try it. We just need to rebuild the. We need it to rebuild the tool chain with our C flags. It should be changed. Okay. Let's try it. Uh, cross dev. So we'll do cross dev. Um, T help. So we'll do cross dev stable T risk V64. I am, I'm just going to try this because that, that's not valid. Um, unknown Linux GNU. 
I think that's what I want. Let's see what happens here. I want this to yell at me. I need an output overlay? What? Doesn't tell me I need that shit. Why? Why though? Oh, it requires root. Oh, I see. Yeah. That makes sense. All right. Let's see if this yells at me. Okay. Let's see if it's this that it's complaining about. Yep. So. And what does it take? What? Softload Linux ELIBC. So I can say, let's use their form that they specify. Um, so there's a vendor field unknown. Linux. Yeah, I, I think it, it is supposed to be this. So I don't know why they need a custom overlay. Oops. Uh, I see. OV output or consult this. Parent directory of overlay to write cross dev package links. Default uses repo name with cross dev or cross blah. Or falls back to first. Okay. So, okay, well, that worked. Oh, it's unknown elf GCC. Not that it matters. So, why do they need an overlay? Okay. Generates into one or four places. An overlay specified with that. Overlay named that. Finally, it falls back to that. Uh, from disturbing layman's overlays. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to do that another time. <laughs> Let's see now if this just builds. And why is it trying to use that linker? Like, I'm actually really surprised that it's trying to use that. Um, okay, so we can do, uh, rust flags s dash C linker is moose. I think it's linker. Watch parts of the CPP con one plus talk during questions. They uh, mentioned some rust runtime. Look at that GitHub code, expected Gamoso style comments, disappointed. Yeah, that's not, uh, that's not code that I've worked on. Um, 
export path is opt bin path. Okay, risk v64 gcc. Uh, pie not supported. Yeah, I agree. Why is it passing fucking pie? Damn it, Rust. I guess it's just this GCC doesn't have pie. I don't know. I haven't actually tried building uh, Risk V Rust, but it's I'm like close. Um, is it linker flags? Linker args, I think. Hmm. Oh, it's link args. Yeah. Mm, no pie. <laughs> please. 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 No dash pie. Fuck. Will we get Rust to build for Risk Five? be pretty dank um uh it keeps passing dumb shit i'm really surprised that it's like how did we do this for a kernel how did it know to Each frame header. Yeah. Can I just steal this? Is this gonna work? Are the quotes gonna match? Quotes look good. Okay. If the quotes work, then we just delete this. Um. Ignored. Can't link, uh, yeah, it's not making RV64i. Unfortunately, they have this, which is kind of annoying. Um, let's see if I can get uh, Rust to tell me what flags I can pass here. Otherwise, we can just go back to the C. Uh, but I'm kind of just curious. I like going down these rabbit holes. Uh, print target CPUs. Hmm. Hmm. Uh, let's see. Target features. Um. Enables libraries with C runtime libraries to be statically linked. Huh. So let's try. See target feature 
minus M minus F minus E minus D minus C minus A. Is that really going to work? I mean, it, this is still going to fail in the same way, but I'm curious if that's going to. Ooh. Uh. Cannot be used for a target that doesn't support. Actually, is there a target ABI? Yeah, let's see what's going on here. Uh, print targets. Fuck. Print target list. There's iMac. That's what I want. So iMac minus C. Okay. Unknown nun elf. Try this. Oh, this might have much better success now. Oh, did that? Nice. That's not going to need the no pi. Okay, so we basically say minus C. Uh, so now we're getting to a cleaner line, which is kind of cool. Hello, I'm a CS Honor grad. I'm looking for advice. Uh, since I've now started building things like using frameworks or using technologies, but I instead want to build these frameworks or technologies, uh, but I don't know how to start on it. Um, well, what languages do you know? I think uh, kind of like knowing languages is going to have to be uh, step number one. Um, does this work? Nice. Libc init array. And exit. Undefined reference to main. I see. No mangle. Uh, extern fn main. Undefined reference to exit. Um, yeah, because we don't define exit, but we will now. We'll just do this. Uh, and we'll just... We'll get this to shut up, but libc init array. Nice. Uh, I'll try to, uh, hmm. We'll just do cargo clean for now. And I'm really curious now. Uh, extern fn test. A, U64, B, U64, uh, U64, A times B. So we're building iMac right now. But I will be curious if I can uh, reduce those flags even more. Okay. Target, risk this, release, benchmark. Fuck yeah. 
I have no idea where it got Memset from. That's kind of cool. Libc init array. Mm, that's getting optimized out during the linking phase. I see. So, yeah, actually, why do we have that libc stuff? Why do we need um, an it array? And then elf GCC. I also worked at companies. I uh, I develop Rust web APIs, etc. I use Java Python at work. I don't want to continue this. It does not feel like real computer science. I want to develop framework search technologies like Docker, for example. Uh, you're really gonna need to learn uh, like a, a lower level language, probably like a like a C plus plus or a C. Um, if you already know Java, that's a good direction. Like C C C sharp, Java, and then also like C and C++, you probably should know all four of those languages um, if you want to be like super effective and work in many different environments, which you typically have to do if you're working with, um, uh, you typically have to do that if you're working with uh, making frameworks and stuff. So, okay, I'm curious what this is expecting. I'm gonna see if I can get this to just be start. Future starts. Now is that actually causing that to get linked up now? No. Uh, at least I don't think it is. Jal, start array. Um, so it calls init array, and then I think it gets very frustrated there. I'm kind of confused. I kind of would have expected this to just take main. Uh, let's just try this. Turn zero, uh, risk v gcc test dot c. Okay. So everything there looks fine. I don't know what Rust is doing. Um, that's jumping to main, and in our version, we're not seeing that. It's jumping to start array, or init array. But I shouldn't have to implement that. Let's see uh, what flags are being passed. Oh, it's probably passing... Um, hmm. I don't think it's getting the CRTs. Let's try and get, uh, see, a link. Args uh, LGCC. GC sections. Oh, I'm not on Debian anymore. <laughs> That's outdated. Uh, I mean, it's pulling in CRT0. Is it the GC sections? Is that the problem? Oh, no default libs. Of course. Let's get rid of GC sections. It's definitely no default libs that's killing us. Let's try this. Yeah, that worked. Um. So how do I say use default libs? I don't think you can do default libs, but if I can, that would be great. <laughs> I 
Otherwise, uh, probably just dash LC will work here for libc. Dash LC. Come on. Come on. Ooh, missing exit. Undefined reference to exit. What distro are you running? Uh, Gentoo. We're running Gentoo right now. Okay, so that is much better. Undefined reference to main? Yep. And there's our main. So it just doesn't like exit. Um. Let's see if we can get it working here. Um, we're gonna get rid of the LC, which will give all of those problems before. And we're gonna see if we can append something to this um, that'll allow us to link. So default libs, no default libs, no no default libs. Hmm. <laughs> Because I want to get, basically, I need LC, I need LGCC, CRT1, mm. so LGCC, what needs exit? Who would define that? Uh, opt risk v. Um. Hmm. Okay, we can do like a uh, fine start at A, Zargs, Objdump, D, grep exit. Okay, I don't know which one that is, but we can binary search it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be libc? It's not libc. Who the fuck would have that? Yeah, libm, it wouldn't be libm. Uh, libsim, it's libsim. Elsim. Uh, missing error now. Oh, maybe I don't need Elsim. So that actually seems really cool. Um, so we have sim.specs, no sys.specs, and nano dot specs do I have any other so I also have L gnosis ah there we go um and what else is there nano L so that would be LC nano I don't know what that is well, we don't really care. Um, L gnosis. Okay, sweet. Bam! So then we should be able to go back to this command and add to this L gnosis.
I don't know if I can have a space like that. I don't think I can, but we'll see. What? What? Elnosis. Didn't this work? So, Elsie has to come first. I think quotes are getting fucked. We're trying Rust for Risk V. Where does GCC come into the picture? GCC is the linker here. Oh, it really doesn't like that. Okay, we'll do C link arg, uh, singular LC. Okay, and then let's see if we can pass another link arg. Gnosis. This is the one, right? Uh, let's just take this and uh, then make file. Look at that. A dot out, test dot C, cargo lock. So we should be able to run make and this will build. That's fucking sweet. So iMac. So this should have uh, a multiply in it. Well, test won't be exported, but let's see. Object dump targets, risk, release, uh, benchmark. And there's main, nice. Test five, six. Um, how am I gonna source those? so they don't get optimized out. I guess we can just build it without optimizations, question mark. Debug. Uh, profile dot dev, panic is abort. Let's see. Didn't notice about music on Gamosa stream? Yeah, I changed my encoding such that I can strip out the music in post. So when I upload the VOD, I can uh, worry about it there. Okay, and then we can do debug. So that means we can have uh, music playing uh, on stream, which is kind of fun. Um, I might change up the playlist a bit. Let's see. Let's see what I can seed it with. Um. Hmm. Hmm. What's a good playlist here? Problem is, it's always gonna converge to the same thing because that's just how this shit works. Uh, unfortunately, let's try this. Let's see how this goes. Uh, okay. Um, what are we doing? We've seen if there's a multiply in here. And let's find main. Main. That calls the actual main of the Rust world. Uh, this is the, is this main? 
No. No, this should actually be the main. That's calling, oh, that calls test. And then test does a multiply. Sweet. And that's Rust code that's emitting that. And that's because we're on uh, iMac. So what we're going to try is um, C. What, what was it? Um, hmm. Uh, target features. So I'm gonna try some fun stuff. Target features minus I minus M minus A minus C. So this should not build because uh, we'll need I, but I just wanna make sure. Um, yeah, it, it literally, uh, oh, target. I is not a recognized feature. Sweet. So can we get rid of Mac? Holy shit. Come on. Yes! Yes. Yes, 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 yes. So where is our... Yep. 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 Oh my god, that's so cool! Basically, there's no more uh, multiply instructions, right? We've gotten rid of uh, the ability for multiplies and atomics and all those fun things. So, this is now building a very, very, very lightweight uh, Risk v So, this is an RV64i um, binary. Okay. So, does the Rust runtime depend on under exit? Um, not too sure. I'm not. I'm not super worried about it because we're kind of hacking it up. We're just trying to get something to build, not something that we can run. Um, so, can I do this? So, this is the same except we want to do release here. Somehow I have caps on. Okay, that's building a release build now. Okay. And the problem is that's gonna get stripped out. Um, and I don't know a great way around that, to be honest. Basically, it's getting GC'd during a GC section. So... Um... Hmm... I don't know if there's a good way for me to not garbage collect a, a function. How to prevent it from discarding a section. There's a used attribute. Um, I don't know if Russ has it, though. What? What? It can't be that easy. Oh, that's only on a static variable. Oh, you can't do it on a function? Hmm. So, can I do this then? Because it shouldn't be able to GC text. It's kind of a kludge. Um, oh, is it still putting in its own section? Yeah. Oh, that's dumb. You can only do used on a static. I 
I don't know if there's a good way to do that in Rust. That'd be kind of neat. I kind of want used static items. Yep. Um, yeah, I don't see if there's a great way to do that. This black box, that's mainly for optimizations. Um, okay. So I can maybe do, it's kind of gross, but apparently I could do this. Once again, mainly for testing. Uh, C link arg wl undefined test. So we'll see if that does the trick. This song goes hard. This is uh, Make Me Fade. Oh, did that fucking work? Well, we don't know if it's in here. Hey, test, load immediate five, fuck yeah. Easy, dude, easy. Awesome. So, can I just do this? Is that gonna make a loop? Is that gonna make a loop? Link dead code. Um, keep dead code. Okay. Now that's gonna make this really thick. But let's see. Let's try it. See, link dead code. Yes. So default is no, and we said yes. There's actually a lot of stuff that we can do. Ooh. Oh, um. Is that because we got rid of atomics? Let's give it atomics again, and we'll see if that works. Lana Del Rey, greater than T-Swift, ooh. Will this work? Yes! Nice, and that also means that everything is resolved. Since we're not removing sections, this has made sure that every single thing in this, this is gonna be a massive file now. Um, okay, maybe not. Uh, maybe it is, and it just, uh, the terminal's that fast now. Okay, well there's test. So, I guess it only is for this compile unit or something. But anyways, let's see what test is doing. Um, test. Load immediate, load upper immediate, add IW, 
set. Um, okay, so this is basically uh, a one is our uh, our termination. Um, zero. That's actually a really weird code gen, but anyways, in the loop is uh, this. Why? Why would it do that? Because this is not a uh, processor width. Yeah, we'll do this. Huh. Basically, before the assembly, it has to make sure. Um. But before the assembly line, it needs to make sure all the variables are in a same state. Um, and so it actually is forced to sign, resign, extend that. So now it doesn't have to do that. So this loop, this is literally load a zero with uh, a million and then decrement in a loop, right? This is literally the assembly that I would have written. So what this means is I should be able to name this function dump certificates and take two args and discard them. And this now should produce a fuzzable program. So the uh, dump certificates, yep. And that's just gonna loop for a million instructions. <laughs> That's all it's going to do. So what we should be able to do now is scoop this onto Grizzly. And then change this into using benchmark. Nice. Three hundred and sixty five billion instructions a second, four hundred billion instructions a second. Not bad. Um, not bad at all. So that's kind of basically without memory operations, the performance we get, that's basically a branches, and that's not even cheap. Like, that's not even really that indicative of the, of the true performance of this. So what we should do is some math. Uh, what I'm going to do is inside this loop, we're going to add ass. <laughs> ass. Oh, man. We're just going to add... Uh, a0, A1, A2. Ah, we'll, we'll let the compiler give me some registers. I'm going to say, I just need a register. Um, how do you do this? Um, we'll say uh, temp1 is a in out reg, which is initialized to 0 and is discarded. Uh, actually, it's just an output. It's just a clobber. So we should be able to now do temp1, temp1, temp1. Dude, this is so fucking cool. Oh, I get to use the nice Rust syntax? Or the nice assembly syntax? Look at that! There's the add. Binez to here. Okay. So then we can uh, repeat this 32 times. End our. Get rid of the loop count. Honestly, I'm okay with going to that. Oh, I fucking love this language, man. Rust is so good. Androidler1, thank you so much for the sub. Hell yeah. Hope you're having a wonderful day. 
Okay, and then we're gonna just get rid of dependencies by doing uh, one into two. I mean, it doesn't really matter. We're gonna try this for now. So here's our new program. Basically, we have this unrolled 32 times. And then the loop is not a big part of the uh, benchmark at this point. Scoop it over to Grizzly. And then let's see what our perf is. It's basically just doing a bunch of ads now. Yeah! Look at that! 1.4 trillion instructions a second. Fuck yeah! <laughs> <laughs> you see why I wanted to do the benchmark? Yeah, that's fucking perf right there. That's the major perf. Uh, 1558 divided by 96 cores. So we're doing, we're doing 16 trillion, in, uh, or sorry, 16 billion instructions a second per core. <laughs> and that's risk five. We've got a we've got a 16 gigahertz risk 5 <laughs> emulator here. <laughs> See, my emulator is not down on per. <laughs> Isn't that fucking cool? It's probably probably the fastest risk 5 emulator. <laughs> Fifteen eighty-eight divided by ninety-six cores, sixteen point five billion risk five instructions per second per core. <laughs> um so if we did the actual math of what we're what we're truly doing, we're doing a hundred and ninety-two threads, eight VMs which is 1536, divide it down. We are emulating. If we want to be more accurate, right now we are emulating 1,536 1 gigahertz RISC-V processors. <laughs> so we're basically emulating a GPU worth of, like if you made a GPU with 1,000 CUs, <laughs> Or, uh, uh, with, uh, cores, with a thousand, uh, 1500 cores, and they're risk 5 cores at 1 gigahertz, that's what we're running right now. <laughs> that's what our emulator's doing. <laughs> Big perf. Is there an advantage of risk processors over Intel's and ARM's? I mean, ARM is a risk processor, technically, uh, but risk 5 is just cheaper. It's a, it's a free, uh, architecture. God, that's so fucking cool, man. That's pretty good. Is it good? Is this good? Um, let's let's throw another ad in there that is on a different dependency. This might get us more perf. Boop. Ah, uh, looks about the same. Maybe a bit more. It's a bit more, but not that much more. Um. So I actually don't know what this processor is capable of. Let's uh, let's figure that out right now. Let's do the math. Uh, proc CPU info. So we're gonna do the clock rate of the processor. Uh, wow, we're running 2.7 gigahertz right now. No fucking way. Really? Holy shit. We're not running into any thermal issues. Dude, that's amazing. So we're running 2.7 gigahertz. So here's the math. This processor is able to do 
billion cycles per second on 96 different cores, I can do eight mathematical operations in each of the vector instructions, which I can do two per cycle of. So the theoretical performance that I would ideally be able to get would be 4.1 billion ads a second. Why am I actually that slow? I'm at like half speed. Unless it's not actually running at 2.7 and it's running at like 2.3. Uh, or down clocking even worse than that. It, it probably isn't. Um, it's probably actually running at 2.7. I think that's what I observed when I did AVX uh, 512 benchmarking on this machine before. I know we're on a tangent. Um, but I do like checking on the performance here to see if there's anything that's really hurting us. Um, and maybe it's just unrolling. Maybe I just need to un unroll this a bit more. We'll go to like 256, which is ridiculous. Um, but my loops are very expensive. And yeah, that's not really getting us anything. So we're bottlenecking basically entirely on the instructions. So let's do a PS... A. Like, that got us some speed, but not much. Um, let's do a GDB78458. Um, okay. So, how do I... How do I look at another thread's context in GDB? I always forget threads in GDB. It's never something I have to really worry about it. Uh, I can probably just say thread too, right? There we go. Okay, so here's the instructions that actually got emit. Um, so this is effectively what we're executing. Uh, this should be able to saturate the processor, and the reason it cannot is... Whoa, why do we have a dependency there? Um, so the output is, is good from the JIT, uh, which is fantastic, but, so the K-mask might hurt us a little bit, uh, we're doing merge masking with a full mask, so we should be okay, oh, it's merge masking is killing us, but also... Oh, we don't have a dependency. Okay. Uh, 27, 26. Um, set it into a syntax that's readable. Yeah, so that's out. 27, 28 are going in, outputting to 26. Then 25, 25 into 27. Why is it doing that? Is that actually intended? I don't know if my optimization passes are doing anything super smart here. Um, what's the code look like? Ads of this. I don't know why that wouldn't look the same. It must be the way that I'm scheduling the registers. Interesting. So... Using the uh, merge masking is definitely hurting us here. Um, we're almost exactly at half performance. And I bet it's fucking merge masking. Let me see if I can globally disable that just for some funsies. Um, if I say K mask is uh, zero merging, let's see what happens here. I 
I can't do zero masking, but I'm curious if this gets my perf. Ooh. Uh, there's an instru uh, one of these instructions is going to be invalid. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll make a uh, K mask Z, which uses uh, zero merging. And we'll do this for ads. So ads, we'll use a K mask zero. That should at least make most of them, which is basically this loop here, um, use zero masking. Huh. It must be the way that I'm scheduling registers. Interesting. So I think I am optimizing Whoa, am I? Uh-oh, uh-oh. Is it, is it due to the instruction tracking? Literally the act of counting the instructions. Uh, let's try. What are we doing on instruction starts? Okay, let's take a look at um, So we have the I count register if we disable instruction count tracking I think So basically we know 3856 uh, fuzz cases a second. What was it? I'm gonna take. We're gonna take the fuzz cases a second. Uh, three eight eight two point eight four and divide it by nineteen eighty point six six. Or technically, go the other way. So it's a point five one multiplier. Um, I think literally it's the cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Literally, counting the instructions that have executed is destroying my performance, right? Just tracking that information is actually slowing me down. So what I can do is I can multiply this EFCPS by this 5-1 that I have in my calculator that you can't see. 7401, multiply it. We're doing 3.7, yeah. Now we're doing 3.7 trillion instructions a second. And it's going to be even faster as uh, that count goes up. But now, if we take a look at uh, PSX, um, uh, 79130, uh, thread 2, X10 IPC. Yeah! Fuck yeah! Look at that code gen. I don't know why I have a dependency... Ch oh, I don't have a dependency chain. It's because uh, set disassembly flavor intel... Yeah, yeah, it's literally just converted that uh, into vector code. So if I multiply my magic 0.51 multiplier by 7560.78, we're doing 3.8 billion instructions a second, um, or trillion instructions a second. Uh, and then if we do this and we figure out our uh, 2.7 times 96 cores times two instructions per cycle times eight ads per cycle, uh, 4.1 uh, trillion a second, uh, 147, uh, oops, 4147. Divide those two. We are running at 93% efficiency right now. <laughs> 93% efficiency. Oh, and this number is climbing. Oh, it wasn't even in its final form. 
Uh, let's go find it now. Okay. Uh, 5519.3? No, it's decreased. Oh, I think we selected the screen or something. And caused it to fuck up. But effectively, the multiplier, well... We kind of we kind of know what the multiplier is, so we know a fuzz case is going to run. Uh, we can actually probably get rid of some unrolling now. The unrolling is probably hurting us. So we have uh, we're repeating these two instructions 16 times. So we have 32 repetitions of that instruction. We're then doing this a million times. So we're doing 32 million instructions per fuzz case. Um, oh, and let's rebuild and do all this shit. Okay, do this. I love benchmarking this. <laughs> I love benchmarking this. Um, nice. Nice run ratio. So then I can take... The number of fuzz cases per second, and I can multiply it by 32 million. Can I do 32e6? Yes, I can. Um, and then I can divide this by 1e9. And this is the billion instructions a second. So maybe I need to unroll more. Did I do the math wrong? Uh, 32... Let's put this to 64, so it's 128, and we're going to add another iteration to the loop. So this is now going to be um, uh, 10e6, which is the loop count, times 64, times 2, which is the number of instructions, and then the number of cases a second actually has fucking stayed the same. <laughs> oh, wait, something's wrong here. Uh, we didn't rebuild it. Okay. I was about to say, yeah, it makes no sense that uh, that would stay the same. Woo! Okay, so this should be lower. Three point two. And this number's still climbing. Nice. Fuck yeah. I need to make a moving average on this number pretty badly. Uh, this is a, a, a complete average. I just lost power. Fucking rip, man. Yikes. Yikes. I told you it was going to happen. This is probably the end of the stream, I, I guess. So, oh, power's back. Fuck yeah. <laughs> we good. <laughs> we, we We good. <laughs> UPS for the win? Hell yeah, UPS for the win. <laughs> yeah, we got some major UPSage going on. Fuck yeah. Dude, I love that. My internet survives. This server survives. This server's currently running like fucking 1,500 watts right now. No problem. Coasting. All right, what's it up to now? I fucking love that. I love how I'm SSH'd into a server that's running at like a 1.5 kilowatts right now, and it doesn't fucking phase me. <laughs> oh, love it. <laughs> Why do I lose power? Because we're, yeah, I'm in a storm right now. God, that UPS is amazing. How many UPSs... How many UPSs just coordinated the event that just happened? I think three? Three were responsible for my stream not going down? Did I even drop a frame? No, I didn't even drop a frame! <laughs> oh, what? I didn't... <laughs> yeah. So, I've got three, I mean, I've got like six UPSs, or the UPS beeps. So, 
you actually heard the UPS beep of my uh, workstation, which is on the in the direction of the microphone. So my computer that I'm on right now, gamey, has a dedicated UPS just for this computer. Technically, for my speakers and my amp and like my basically my whole desk is on one UPS here. Then. Uh, I also have a switch and Wi-Fi on that UPS. I should actually move the Wi-Fi to a different UPS, because uh, this computer is often running like a game. Like, if I was in a raid right now, I'd be chugging power. Um, I mean, I probably barely touched the UPS, because that was only like 10 seconds without power. But then I have a switch and a Wi-Fi uh, access point on this UPS. The switch then goes through into my server room, into another switch, which is on, which is my internet, and my internet is on a dedicated UPS running a low power server that literally could last like four hours on the UPS. So the internet basically has its own UPS, like, and I really should get like a Microtik, like MIPS low power device. I should have like a, I should have like a one watt thing on a whole like, desktop UPS. So I just have infinite internet on the UPS. So I basically UPS for the gaming computer, UPS for the uh, switch and the router and the modem, uh, which provides my internet to my whole house. But then I'm also SSH'd into one of my compute nodes. And my compute node is on a real UPS. So, like, the desktop UPS is, like, uh, the UPS that I have on my desktop and for my Switch is the standard APC UPS that you get in, like, if you have an office where you have, like, a UPS like that. It's just a standard fucking plug it into the wall and it has a couple ports on the back and you plug it in. <laughs> but th this server is plugged into a fucking real UPS, which is a rack mount uh, I think 4U, maybe 6U. I think it actually is 6U. Um, which is an... Uh, I think it's an 8 kilowatt UPS. It runs hardwired. Uh, it's hardwired into my electrical system of my house. It does not have a plug. Like, it has a custom connector that like the electrician had to make and like screw in all the terminals and make like a custom conduit because it runs on a dedicated 240 volt 60 amp circuit <laughs> literally i have a 240 volt 60 amp circuit directly into the ups and then all of my servers run off of that um and the reason I have a separate UPS for my internet is that the internet is super low power and passive, and I also want my internet to last long, last longer than my servers. If I'm not mistaken, I think that UPS can keep the, um, it can keep like seven or eight kilowatts of gear powered for like 10 minutes. So basically, I could run like all of my servers. I'm at like one third UPS capacity if I run everything, and I never run everything. I'm running like one quarter load right now. So that UPS could probably run this server for like an hour, hour and a half. So like we're not even close to the margins. The, the, the first one that's gonna go out is my computer, my desktop right here, because I'm encoding, my GPU's running, I've got a little bit of CPU usage. Like, it's so fucking cool, man. <laughs> but yeah, that's that's what just coordinated that. Need a UPS emote? This is a home setup? Yeah. How many machines is that? I don't even know. I probably have like 15 or 16 servers racked. Uh, one, two, three, four, five. Oh, maybe it's only like eight or ten. I don't know. It's hard to say. It, it's like 50 U worth of gear, but I have a lot of 4 U's. <clears throat> serious home lab. Yeah, it is a serious home lab. Like, I think that UPS was like six grand. Like, it's 
It was almost as much as some of the, the servers I have in there. <laughs> Just for the UPS. Which literally, that six grand provides me zero value other than those like five seconds we just experienced. Those five seconds every, every couple months. <laughs> That's it. That's literally what it's there for. <laughs> I could have bought like three top the line gaming computers, but instead I just have something that smooths me out in the power domain. But no, I have really flaky power. I, I probably lose power like, probably lose power like 10 to 15 times a month in the winter. Um, they actually just restrung the main power lines, uh, by the road that distribute to my neighborhood. So hopefully reliability goes up, but we'll see. Um, yeah, I, I lose power for like 20 hours a month in the winter. So I think it, I think the UPS is worth it. Literally the, the point is that the UPS can survive as long as it takes. Like, I could have this fuzzer running. I could lose power, wait 30 seconds or a minute to see if it's going to come back on trivially, make the decision that it's not going to come back on trivially, run out to my garage to start the generator, find that the generator is completely out of fuel, jump in my car drive to the gas station, fill up a tank, drive it back, fill up the generator, start the generator, and have power off the generator, and have all of my servers and computers still running. That is literally what I have designed my setup for. Now you might be asking, why don't you have an auto generator that kicks on and runs off of natural gas to your house? And that's on its way. <laughs> Why do you lose power so often? I live in rural America. I live in an unincorporated town. I live in a town of 200 residents. That's like 20, 20 minutes from the nearest like real city. Uh, I live in the mountains. I drive up like a thousand or 1500 feet of elevation in my neighborhood. Like, after I turn off the street and get into my neighborhood, I, dr like, make a, like, thousand-foot elevation change. And it's all wooded and all trees, which means the power lines are literally weaving in and out of trees. Uh, so, basically, in the winter, when we have a shit ton of rain, which weighs down branches, and then a, even just a 20-mile-an-hour gust is enough to knock down, like, a heavily saturated piece of... Uh, uh, of wood to like fall over on a power line. So, no, it happens all the time. Um, I'm currently looking at getting like a industrial generator for my house, and that's kind of the plan right now. I don't know if I have the, a large enough pipe uh, for natural gas to support it. Um, but what I want is uh, what I really want is. Like, I basically want a 240 volt, 200 amp generator. So, that's kind of the goal. <laughs> and that, the problem is it's pretty expensive. And I, it, it's relatively large. Um, but ideally I would have a, it, it would be like a real like Generac generator that you would see like, at a data center or like an industrial site. And it would be capable of running my whole house off of natural gas. Um, and it would like auto kick on when I lose power. So it would be a seamless trans transition. And it would basically make me feel bulletproof in the winter. Uh, the problem is they're not cheap. So I don't know if it's worth it. The, the reason I want 240 volt, 200 amp is because that is my service uh, from the power company. So I get, I get 240 volt, 200 amp. That's basically the standard power that a American household gets. Um, in If you've had a house built since like 1970, uh, you'll typically be running a 200 amp, 240 volt uh, system um, for 
before like 1970, 100 amp was more common, and 100 amp can be common. Obviously, you get like 208 in a lot of apartment buildings because you're on three phase. Um, but setup sounds bonkers. Yeah, so basically, if I had a 240 volt, 200 amp generator, I would have a generator that is capable of generating the power that I get from the grid. Which means that I literally would be able to continue my life as if nothing has happened entirely on the generator. That means I can be fucking sitting, having like 10 kilowatts running in the server room, a kettle on the stove, refrigerator running, sitting outside in the hot tub, running a blender to make some smoothies, right? Like literally fucking everything running off that generator like it would just feel so nice because a, a lot of people if, you, if you're not familiar with generators typically when you have generators you'll have two panels in your house you'll have one electrical like circuit breaker panel uh for your main system and then you'll have one for your generator and the one for the generator is often going to be a very small subset of your house so, like, your generator typically, like, for the standard generator that you'd go and buy and kind of plug into your house, you're probably going to get, like, 5 to 10 kilowatts off of it. So, you'll have it basically power your fridge and freezer so you don't end up, like, throwing away your food because you lost power. Um, you'll have your, like, stove top, and then you'll maybe have lights in, like, 30% of the rooms and nothing else. You're not going to have your oven. You're not going to have your microwave. You're not going to have your computers, your office. You're going to basically have enough lights that you can go by kind of ambient light coming through the doorway of another room to like guide you throughout the house so you don't trip over shit. And then you have it to power your, your fridge so you don't destroy your food and like lose money on your food. And you can run your stove so you can cook some basic necessities and boil water. That's about it. So being able to have your entire house on a generator, even your luxury items like your, your office, your computer, a fucking hot tub is ridiculous to have on a generator. And that's kind of what I'm planning to do. Um, mainly because I lose power that much in the winter. Like literally it is worth the probably 10 or 20 grand to get a system like that due to how frequently I lose power. Now, if you're a normal human being and you have a normal sleep schedule and you sleep at night and you don't rely on your computer for literally 100% of your entertainment, then yeah, you just fuck off and you like go outside. Uh, but for me, the problem is I'm typically awake at night and when you're awake at night, losing power at night sucks. You can't really go outside and just fuck around. You can't do anything inside because you can't see shit. You can't play games. Like, maybe you can play, like, fucking Scrabble against yourself to candlelight, but it blows. Like, you could kind of read a book by candlelight, but that also kind of sucks. Like, candlelight is pretty dim, and it's a lot of eye strain. Um, TLDR... If you're a nocturnal human being who relies on their computer for basically every form of entertainment and work, losing power for like 20 or 30 hours a month fucking sucks. <laughs> what do you do when you're out of power for a long time? Well, I have a generator. Um, I, I have a generator. It's on the fritz. Um, unfortunately, the generator is actually not capable of powering my, uh, UPSs. It, it basically provides, like, 70 volts when it's supposed to provide, like, 120. And the UPSs don't even like it. They're like, what the fuck is this? What am I supposed to do with 70 volts? Uh, but my computer, somehow, the power supply on my computer fucking makes it work. It finds the 12 volts to give to the fucking motherboard somehow in those 70 volts, it, it ekes it out. Um, 
The lights are like super dim. TLDR, the, the generator just probably needs to be rebuilt. Uh, the carbs probably gummed up and it's probably lowing at, running at a slightly lower RPM than it should because the carbs not 100% clean. So I should probably rebuild the engine. So next time I lose power, I will probably rebuild the engine of the carb if it's uh, at daylight. Otherwise, I'll just fucking make do. It still runs my computer. It's okay. But I have to disconnect the UPS, which means I have to reboot. It's kind of a pain in the ass. But... Um, if you live in the middle of the forest alone, it sucks to lose power at night, for sure. So... Or I could just buy another, like, standard $1,000 generator and use my same panel because it can run my servers. It can run kind of my standard setup. Um, but basically, I'd want a generator that can run the uh, server room, which is the 60 amp 240 volt. And that basically puts me in the ballpark of getting an industrial generator anyways, so... I don't know. A little tangent there. Get a larger generator. Yeah. Why living in rural then? Because rural, rural lands are fucking awesome, man. I look outside and I see trees and mountains. There's no one nearby. I have land. I can make noise at night. I will never get a noise complaint. I can fucking blast music and do whatever the fuck I want. I can go onto my hot tub and like just chill. Like, my hot tub is literally, like, five feet away from me if I go out my door to my deck. And I can just be on my computer. I could be fucking around my computer. And I could be like, you know what sounds good right now? Hot tub. And it's like, either I can go upstairs and put on a swimsuit. Or, since I live in fucking rural America, I can just get nude and hop in my fucking hot tub. Like, all I have to do is just grab a towel from my linen closet... And then just jump in the fucking hot tub. It's fantastic. Like, literally, living out in the middle of fucking nowhere is so nice. <laughs> there are so many perks to it. And do you have guns? That's not really a question you ask Americans. Because the answer is always yes. You can't get a birth certificate without a gun in America. Cheaper cost of living? Well, the cost of living here is unfortunately not cheap because I'm 30 minutes outside of Seattle. So I basically pay Seattle prices. <laughs> it's, it's the same fucking cost. In fact, downtown Seattle is actually a little bit cheaper, um, which is kind of weird. You get less land, but you get more house uh, for the same price. <laughs> Better question, how many bullets fit in them clips? Isn't there a, a limit on that now? Like an eight eight round magazine or something? Can confirm, do you still live in a business district with the DJ? Used to have uh, parties far more often than I'm comfortable with? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. It's pretty awesome. Anyway. <laughs> after that sidetrack, what's our perf at? Our perf. Climbed up to 70. 3.5. Yeah. So we're basically at the uh, theoretical maximums of the processor. Okay. Uh, well, that tangent over. TLDR, my emulator is plenty fast. Thank you very much. It runs Risk v faster than the equivalent x86. Because we vectorize it. <laughs> We've literally vectorized it. If you were to write this exact same code in x86, it would run slower than our emulated RISC-V. That's, that's how fucking awesome my code is. And that's why we're just ama uh, amazing, to be honest. And that's why I say it's uh, faster than native uh, execution. It really isn't, because at the end of the day, I put in instruction counts, and included in those instruction counts... I have uh, I have register coverage and code coverage, which is allowing me to get introspection that you can't actually get without massive amounts of instrumentation. I'm able to track memory accesses. Oh yeah, so all memory accesses in here 
our um, our byte level. So basically, if I access one byte out of bounds, I will crash. So I basically have ASAN. I have ASAN supports, uh, register coverage support, uh, SAN cov support uh, for binary targets at basically the same cost that you get those things when you compile them in at compile time. So I'm able to fuzz an embedded firmware that I leaked off of a device that I don't have source to, and I'm able to fuzz it as if I have ASAN um, and all sorts of other performance things. Like, it's... Th this, this technology is, is fucking incredible. Um, I need to set up my VimRC quick. Uh Okay, set Okay, so now I have a uh, color column. Do you remember the first binary you pwned? I mean like in theory like a a fucking like CTF style challenge that I made for myself, but like, um, I mean, it depends what your definition of pwned is. If it's like find code execution, probably Chrome Sandbox. Ah, uh, no, Opera. I basically accidentally found bugs in Opera. Um,. I did some like printer stuff before then, but like Chrome Sandbox is like probably the first real bug I found. And that was a good couple years of sandbox bugs. Now I couldn't tell you the first thing about how Chrome works. Shit's completely changed. I did sandbox stuff on Chrome when they first implemented their uh, sandboxing. So like, they weren't using Mojo for IPC, they were using like their original IPC setup. Um, everything was kind of hand rolled. Uh, there was a lot of surface. There was a lot of surface there. That was some good shit. But yeah, that was probably the first first thing that I actually like really did. But Opera, I basically wrote a browser fuzzer and I ran it against Opera and it found infinite bugs so we had to turn it off because it was finding too many bugs. Like literally it was just filling up disk space. <laughs> I've always imagined it's stressful when you're uh, using multiple vulnerabilities to pwn something and you're worried that they'll patch it before you're done. Oh, for sure. I'd say like... 30 to 40% of the time, you lose at least one part of the chain while developing the chain. Um, it fucking sucks, man. Like, it's, it sucks. It sucks, man. You've always been this hardcore? I've been relatively hardcore. I mean, I've been doing defensive work for three years now, so to be honest, I'm a little out of touch. So, like, I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to fall behind and it's starting to bother me, to be honest. I don't know what I'm going to do about it. I mean, I, I, I still think I'm pretty good at fuzzing. Uh, at least for finding O day. I, I don't think I'm good at finding N day with fuzzers or finding like I'm not I'm not good at CI style fuzzing. Like at, at this point, the people doing lib fuzzer are much better at making uh, CI style fuzzers than I am. Like the the generic ass, you give it maybe a couple files and you point it to a buffer and a length. Sure, I, I've got I, I'm fucking behind there. I, I'm no longer an expert in that field. Um, but when it comes to fuzzing embedded targets that you're not supposed to even have the binary to, let alone the source, uh, like, literally the world I fucking live in, when I do vulnerability research, I don't have fucking source. 
Like, Source is so far from even being a thing I have that it's not even on the radar. Let alone, like, symbols, once again, not even on the radar. Maybe accidentally someone fucked up on, like, a firmware release and I can get a, a symbolized version, but typically not even the case because a symbolized version often doesn't fit in the, like, ROM or whatever I'm fuzzing, like, whatever embedded thing that I have or release build. They won't even have symbols anyways because they, they don't have fucking space. So I often don't have symbols. But often, I don't have binaries either. Like, having a binary to fuzz is a luxury. Like, having a file system that you can just grab a fucking binary off of is a fucking luxury. So, all of my tooling is designed such that I can fuzz leaks. Like, effectively, if I'm fuzzing an iPhone, right... I guess an iPhone's a bad example because you literally can fucking get the images now. But before, when it was encrypted, and it was relatively difficult to get the unencrypted, uh, the, the decrypted binary, which... If you know people, it's pretty easy to just ask, like, hey, can you just give me an iPhone kernel? And often, you'll get a kernel cache. But... If you want to fuzz something that is actually running on the kernel, often what you'll want to do is you'll want to use a kernel exploit to leak whatever you're working on. Or it might not be a kernel exploit, it might be a firmware exploit. Whatever the fuck it is. Like, my specialty is fuzzing things that are never expected to be fuzzed. And that's often use an exploit to leak an actively running kernel. And, like, leak, uh, maybe you're lucky and you get the text section. Maybe you just get a little bit of an approximate area around where you're leaking from. Who fucking knows? Load that shit in an emulator and run it. Like, I don't know. That's kind of, that's kind of what I'm used to. Like, that's what my tooling is designed for. And that's why I'm always going to have disagreements with, like, CI-style fuzzing. Because I, I literally don't understand it. Like, those are not problems that I have, and thus, A, I don't empathize well with them, and B, everything that I've done is just basically not in the direction of that. Like, Fulkervisor is a generic hypervisor for x86, and I used it to fuzz Windows, and of course I don't have fucking source to Windows, I mean now I do, but I didn't before. So like... I was able to fuzz, I was actually fuzzing Defender at the time, which you didn't even have public symbols to. So, holy shit, these trees look like they're just gonna snap. Um, yeah, I, I had no symbols, no source, but I was just able to boot it up and take a full snapshot and resume execution and do snapshot fuzzing with coverage uh, on Windows. And then I made some emulators. I made a, a MIPS emulator, I think was the first emulator I made. Um, maybe I made an ARM emulator before then? I can't remember. I think I made an ARM emulator before I made the MIPS emulator. But I made a... Whichever way, I'm just gonna say I made a MIPS emulator, uh, that provided code coverage and fast resets and snapshot fuzzing. Once again, standard shit, like... Basically, all of the things that I'd hacked into QMU before, I just decided to make my own emulator, and then I did, and it was just so much better than using hacked up QMU. Now, obviously, it's a lot harder, because you have to write a fucking emulator, but, like, I had so much more control, and so much more power, and so much more introspection, and so much less confusion about what got optimized out, or when registers were valid, or where things got cached or what state was active, what state was cached out, how threads work, how to actually influence threads so that you can do race condition fuzzing. Like, writing an emulator is just the most amazing thing when fuzzing. It just gives you so much power. Um, when the hell do you stop streaming from? Uh, when I wake up uh, till I'm done eating dinner? I mean, I, I don't... Uh, I mean, this stream hasn't even been going. We, we're kind of... We still haven't really started the stream. Now we're just on a rant. We've been on a rant for like three hours. We haven't done shit. 
<laughs> we we literally we went on a tangent so I could flex the performance of my emulator. Like literally that's all I did. <laughs> I literally went on a 2 hour tangent so I could flex the performance of my emulator cuz someone said, someone dared to ask if the performance of my emulator is is worth the cost. And the answers are absolutely yes. A, the costs of my emulator are very fucking small. B, my emulator can run things much faster than Linux natively can as long as they're quick fuzz cases. My emulator has no problem doing a billion fuzz cases a second. Linux will struggle to fork 50,000 times a second. It'll struggle to fork 20,000 times a second. I literally have like a, a 100,000x advantage compared to running something natively when it comes to reset costs. Now, obviously I've solved that problem because I have emulate or I have hypervisors that run in my own OS so I can cut slow ass Linux out of the loop and I am able to do a million resets per second per core. And that allows me to fuzz things natively very quickly. But if you're fuzzing things natively, it then becomes much more difficult to get access to coverage. You basically have to use processor trace, which is then a shit ton of code because you need a decoder. It's really hard to use in an operating system context, context because shit is changing out from under you. So I kind of have two different tools. I have Fulkervisor, which is a custom hypervisor for fuzzing basically anything that runs on x86 inside of a hypervisor in my custom OS, which allows, yeah, about a a million resets a second per core as the maximum performance speed. So that is like a hundred million resets a second per uh, for this system, right? Obviously I'm bottlenecking on the actual fuzz case at that point. So the reset cost doesn't matter anymore, but compared to something like AFL where you're gonna run into those boundaries of literally Linux holding you back. Uh, so that problem is solved. Getting coverage can be a pain there, but it, there's, a trade-off of needing an emulator that's capable of running an entire OS. Using a hypervisor is often a benefit in that regard because you don't want to write all of the device emulation. Uh, you'd rather just bang it into a fucking snapshot fuzz or hyper, uh, hypervisor and just go with that. Um, but when I have targets that I very seriously want bugs in, I use this, which is called vectorized emulation. This current version is called soft serve. It is likely the fastest emulator in the world, and it's very likely the most powerful fuzzing framework in the world. But, it is fucking hard to use. It is exceptionally hard to use. Unless you thoroughly understand how to write vectorized code yourself, and you're capable of spending like one to two months spinning up on a target, it is completely fucking worthless because it is hard to use. Oh yeah, and also you might have random JIT bugs that you'll have to fix. I'm actually not aware of any JIT bugs. I haven't seen a JIT bug in over a year, so I feel like there aren't any anymore. But yeah, it's fucking hard. But it's so worth it because I'm able to do three, three and a half trillion instructions a second of emulation uh, and I'm able to gather uh, code coverage and, and feedback mechanisms and all sorts of crazy shit. And right now I'm trying to order some food. So, because I'm fucking starving. Let's see what I can do. Uh, let's get some general sows, the standard. Let's get a uh, fried rice and uh, mm. I say they'll deliver. The problem is living in rural America often it's something people in the city don't know, but these Uber Eats and like Grubhub apps often fucking lie about whether or not you can get food delivered. And it's really annoying. Um, God, that sounds so good right now. 
And then we'll get to writing the fuzzer. I, I swear. I swear. We'll, we'll make it there. Mm. Oh, man. That's general so's with doubt or dark meat. Fuck, yeah. Yeah, we'll get one of those as well. Serve with steamed rice. Perfect. All right, ordering. Nice. Okay. In theory, I'm going to get that. All right, I'm going to hit the head. I'll be right back. What song is this? Uh, oops. This. Um, do you sell this stuff? Sounds like it's worth a fortune. So, no. Uh, these tools are not valuable to anyone else other than me. They're really hard to use. They take a lot of energy to use. And basically, no one would find these valuable other than, other than me. Um... The fact that I can write them makes me valuable. The fact that I'm capable of, of designing things that aren't as sophisticated as this. Uh, that, or more so, the fact that I know what is possible to do with computers, I can make the decision of basically what features can and can't be reasonably implemented. And that's what I did at Microsoft, right? I wrote a emulator that was forked off of box i forked it off of box because i know they wouldn't want to write their own device emulation which i typically would do but we use box as a baseline since it'd be easier uh and then i made it fully deterministic made it a snapshot fuzzer made it work with windows added some enlightening added kd net support so you could debug it with kd um and just kind of made like a nice and polished distributed fuzzing framework for them yeah is it there's like a lot of things about it that are very slow, but those trade-offs are made for usability, right? It's very difficult to write a high-performance fuzzer and a, a high-performance fuzzer and a high-performance uh, uh, device emulator and CPU emulator and memory management stuff and all the forking and whatever. So basically, I just made differential snapshot fuzzing uh, that could handle the entirety of Windows, and it could work on Hyper-V, so you could fuzz a hypervisor inside of it, gather code coverage, get feedback, get module, module offset information. Like, it's basically Babby's first system-level snapshot fuzzer. That's really all it is. So, um, and yeah, I stopped working on it relatively quickly because it's not necessarily the type of thing that I'm interested in working on because it's it's not as researchy it's more uh user focused right it's more about making it easy to use uh and making it powerful by bringing the features um to be accessible to other people so like I am more into the make the most amazing shit possible and suffer with the consequences of how hard it is to operate with, uh, but typically that doesn't work too well in a corporate environment. <laughs> so, 
the the things that I do are not the most valuable things when it comes to uh, defensive work. <clears throat> I'm probably just like ten years ahead of defensive work. <laughs> like, although that lead is dis very quickly disappearing as people are finally starting to look at hypervisors and snapshot fuzzing. So honestly, I probably only have like a four-year lead. <laughs> but, um, basically, I'm working on what is possible, and other people are working on making those things tangibly usable to other people, right? Uh, I'm working on a $100,000 light bulb that is the first light bulb to exist, and everyone else is working on making that 100,000 light bulb maybe not be as perfect or as vacuum tight or as bright, but cost $10 instead, <laughs> right? And basically there are sacrifices that have to be made there. Okay, where the fuck were we? <sighs> uh, let's add corruption back. And there's some optimization passes I need to add to this. Oh, yeah, I also need to, before I forget, I need to remove, uh, I need to remove this optimization pass. XXX uh, disabled for reg uh, cov. Okay. I don't know how much performance I lose by disabling reg prop. I think I lose a decent amount. You still at Microsoft? Yeah. That's ultim ultimately what the stream is for right now. Wow. I lose a lot of performance by getting rid of reg prop. I I'm okay with that. I'm losing like 20% performance there. Um, I'm not too surprised. Okay. That basically uh, disables the, basically regprop allows me to access uh, guest registers through registers by aliasing them to x86 registers. Um, and if I don't do that, it's, uh, everything's gonna be a memory access. So we have more memory accesses here and more memory accesses. But I'm also instrumenting register accesses such that I can see what registers have been tainted. Um, and that allows me to, uh, let's see if this works. I think this might not work. This might be the first thing that does not just work on Gen 2. Yeah. I mean, I'd need to add these. Uh, I don't know what this is. I could maybe try and find this library and add it quick. Um... Is there a good way to see, like, where in Gentoo this exists? Um... Hmm... Okay, where is Masters BCW? Thank you so much for the Twitch Prime. Hell yeah! Hope you're enjoying the content. Uh, MIT Care B5. Thank you. How did you find that? Did you just know it? And is that this GSS API? Is there a way to search for like the .so? I have it installed, okay. Um, uh, looks good. This shouldn't take long. These are tiny. And you can search for packages with which installed a specific file. Ah, I see.
QQ file. Nice. Uh. Mm. Is it only for libraries? Okay. <laughs> Should work on GCC too. Uh, it's probably a symlink. There. <laughs> Sweet. I don't know how I'll remember that. But that's cool. That's fucking sweet, man. You know what? Is there a binary ninja? Probably not. I don't know if binary ninja is, is popular enough that there would be a, a thing for it. But that would be amazing. In general, there's a query from uh, Gen Toolkit for such things. I haven't installed it yet, but I've been trying to avoid it. Mainly because I know it's just a script that builds on top of existing data. And I found most of the data that I want. They got expensive. This one's not too bad. It's fine. It'll be done in a minute. Is there any alternative to Flaggy these days? Or do people still use it? I don't know. I don't know what Flaggy is. Uh, and then hopefully I also have... Yeah. Because uh, I have a custom lighthouse in here. And license and stuff. Maybe this did get expensive. Why though? That makes no sense. Hey. Um. All right. Let's see. Uh. Enabling disable use flags. Yeah. There's a uh, e use. I think is what most people use now. I've been just manually doing the config files, mainly because I'm just trying to learn. You fucking serious? Is that it? <laughs> Fuck yeah, baby. Let's go. Yeah, easy. Um, so let's see if this works then. We'll go into, let's see if everything works. I love Linux, man. I love how config files are like in your fucking home directory rather than in registry keys so you can actually just like copy files around and restore your system such that you can get shit working the way it was before um really fucking nice uh rv64 test a dot out fantastic uh risk five is working just fine here and I should be able to load that lighthouse script. So let's just do uh, this. Um, yep, so now we can lighthouse and load lighthouse.txt. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. 
God, it is windy, man. You know, is there rip grep in uh, Gentoo? I bet there is. I mean, I can do it through cargo, but the nice thing about doing it uh, globally on the system is I can use it while root, and that's something that I expect I'll do a lot. So we'll just do a uh, uh, emerge ask rip grep. Like building it with uh, cargo or doing doing cargo install is kind of annoying because I just start I, I would have a lot of issues with uh, not being able to use it as root which I often like to be able to do so Yeah, I don't know why that's failing to parse Um Nice. Okay, now I can look for RGB. Whoa. Oh, I'm right. Yeah, that's... Okay. It should be able to load this file. Are we in RV64 test? Yeah, soft serve, RV64 test, lighthouse. Really? I think I need to reload Vingia. I don't know if there's a way to reload plugins, but it would be cool if there is. Hmm. Okay. What? What? How would that What happened? How? Is it Python? Hmm. No, because Python 3 should be fine. Reporting parse failure. Why don't you use language autocomplete? Because uh, it's just annoying. Because it's often wrong. It's often not the information you want. I think it's a uh, it's annoying and it's a crutch and it leads to shittier code. Okay, how the fuck am I gonna? How? 
How? How is this failing? There's literally no debugging, which makes it a pain in the ass. Like, we have Lighthouse. It's something weird. Something silently failing. Hmm. Okay. Let's delete all but one line. Let's see what it thinks about that. Oh, you know what? Did we... Hmm. Okay, this should work in Stock Lighthouse. Is this a valid address? Yes. Okay, something's just fundamentally not working right now. Parse failure. No coverage files could be loaded. So... L message. UI warnings. If I was reporting that, file path there. Okay, let's see what this. this open coverage xref select coverage load coverage files um like i wonder if it's a python issue like, I think that's probably what it is. Which is really annoying, because fixing this is going to suck. Um, hmm. Let me find the API. Log. Let's say this. I think I have to reload it every time. This. Okay, binja not defined, yep. And then that's just gonna fuck off, okay. Uh, import binary ninja. And now we get to uh, debug with prints. Woo! ASDF, nice. So let's see. Uh, okay. Here we can say uh, loaded file.
Okay, so we have lighthouse.txt, and we never loaded one. And we failed probably due to this. God, this wind, man. Heard a thud, must have had a big branch fall in my house. Hey, there we go. Um, coverage reader. Let's do this. Coverage parsing error, string failed. In code. It's not Python 2, is it? I kind of assumed it was Python 3. But if I see in code that, uh, I think that's. Coverage parsing error has no attribute in code. I think that's the, oh, that's actually. I think that's failing because we're trying to print that exception. Okay, sick. Uh, let's go into reader, parsers, RGB trace. Let's see if we hit this. Let's see if this even gets a knit. And if it doesn't, then we know where to look. Init RGB. Okay. Parse RGB. Okay, we hit parse RGB. Okay. Uh, let's see if we make it to done parse RGB. No. Uh, default dict. Is that... Python 3.8. Is that like a newer? No, that's been around for a long time. Uh, uh, let's see. Well, we know that this is not going to match right now. Uh, we have to add this back in. Let's go to here. And then we got to reparse this uh, back into our RGB format. Lighthouse.txt, that's our RGB format. Looks good. Uh, let's try, see what happens. I don't know what wasn't working before. Like we put the assert in, but I mean, now it fucking works.
Increase your scroll back buffer? Yeah. I should do that. I used to do it on the command line, but let's do a million. We did it. Should be able to scroll a bunch now. Oh yeah, look at that. Look at all of that scrolling. Whoa. Whoa! Thanks for that. I actually was gonna look at what to do to do that, because I used to do it with a command line option, which was on DWM, and then I found X resources existed, and then I haven't done it since then. But you can see I use X resources. <laughs> My hot tub blew open. I gotta close that one second, otherwise my cover might go flying. Probably going to keep happening if the wind keeps blowing in that exact same direction. It is windy as fuck. Okay. What are we doing? Oh, we can do this now. I don't know what changed. I literally have no idea what we changed, but who cares? Okay. I think we have pretty much 100% covered anyways, but let's go and make our fuzzer do fuzzing things. <laughs> All right, so to the content of the stream that was intended, uh, at, least, at least unlike most streams, we actually made it to the content. <laughs> it started off so well, and then we went on tangents. Nice. What are we fuzzing? Some shitty X509 X parser. Lib asinine. Okay. So, what we've done is we've loaded up these files. So, basically, we have serialized. Um, we can look at fields. And these fields are the uh, X509 lifted into a structure representation. And this will allow us to mutate fields and add fields um, kind of as they come through uh, this corpus. So I think what we want to do is we want to make a... <laughs> shitty, I mean, it's pretty solid last time we came by. How many bugs did we find? We haven't found any bugs. Doesn't mean it's not shitty. Um... Let's see. Okay. So we have all the fields, and I think what I want to do is I want to write something that can walk these fields. So I'm going to do uh, pubfn walk. And we're going to re use recursive programming, even though I said I wasn't going to. Uh, walk the uh, ASN1 tree. And it, it's basically this, right? It's the th same thing as serializing. But 
Uh, we won't have those outputs. And this we'll just call record.walk. Um, record field for field and fields serialize. Um, we want to do field dot walk. Okay fields.walk, and then hopefully this will print out all of the records. Yes, yes it did. Yeah, we did the decoder without recursion. That wasn't really that bad. Um, the encoder we haven't done without recursion yet, and that's something that I really need to add. I don't know. Let's fucking do it, man. Let's get, let's make the serializer work without recursion. Let's just get that shit done. Um Damn, this beat goes hard. So, we are walking a tree and we are walking a tree in it, we're just doing dfs are we not i think we're just doing dfs yeah lose power Yes, temporarily. Okay, um, not long enough for the beeps to go off. I actually turned off my lights because it's daytime now, so I can't tell if I lost power or not based on uh, lights. I can just hear the relays clicking in the UPSs. Stack that push, um, self. While stack dot len is greater than one. It's literally just this, isn't it? I can do like, while well, at some, oh, I need to, I suck at, at DFS. I always do BFS. Um, while well, at some, field is equal to uh, stack dot pop match can't wait to struggle to implement uh, DFS I always do BFS and I have no idea why field record serialized to out um And then record serialize for field. Instead of field serialize, oh, yeah, this is actually kind of hard. This is actually kind of hard. Um, so, field serialize, record serialize, so, I keep losing power. Yep. Click, click, click. <laughs> oh, how do I want to do this? Let's 
so push stack um pop that off let me push the two things below we then pop the last thing we pushed So I think DFS gets us ballpark what we want. But this isn't going to be perfect. Some of them are going to fail this assertion. Okay. Anything with trailing is going to get fucked. Um, do you use DFS at all often? Yes. I use like D mainly BFS, but I use a mix of DFS and BFS pretty much pretty much daily I come up all the time but I also do a bunch of graph and tree structures so we basically need to uh, are we getting fucked entirely on trailing data and I think the answer is yes Um, probably don't implement it yourself, though. All, all the stuff I do is implemented myself. I don't use third-party libraries. So... Basically, I need to detect when I've gone up on the stack. So I need to record the depth. Uh, depth field. Depth plus one field. Okay. Uh That's not doing what I want. What? Yeah. One bunch of threes. Is that a lambda? Yes. Yeah, it's a lambda. It's extracting the first field out of the stack, which is the depth, and then collecting it into a vector. So I'm only looking at the depth field. Um, oh, is my food almost here? Oh, 
I can't wait. I'm so fucking hungry. Um, okay, so... Basically, I need to keep track of things such that when I pop things up, I need to kind of record those. Mm, cause I, cause I have like the trailing part, which I think I only have to put, basically I, I think we did this the other day on stream. Like we actually did this exact same shit on stream. Um, Is dot zero indexing? It, it's getting the first element from the tuple, the zero thing out of that tuple. Let's see. So Vec is a fixed size of two. It, it's it's not a it's not getting anything out of a vector. That's a tuple. It's not a vector. It's the name. It's basically their zero index names of the elements of the tuple. So it's the first element of the tuple. Um, so, we can push the depth of the stack. I think we need to keep track of like what we're currently processing on a stack as well. Basically, upon going up a level, so like, I have depth. Um, and basically, if the depth goes up, If, is it like this? Uh, if depth is, if the last depth is greater than the current depth, then out extend from slice trailing but I need to get that off the field, which I don't have. Did I just put that in here? Because I want to serialize all those things and then I want to add trailing, which is basically when we go up on the stack or up on the traversal but I don't know where to get trailing right now. Do I have that on the stack? Uh, if I do a peak, no, I can't do that. I mean, I could have I could have a stack that's actually what we're operating on, which which tracks the the nested structure that we're on. So um, s stack to traverse, and then we can do uh, let me stack is vec new 
We can do stack, push, depth field. Stack. Stack dot pop. So basically, we pop it off of there, we add it to this stack, we then traverse into shit, and we'll push onto the to, to traverse list. Um, and then we'll maintain our own stack. So basically, if the depth. See what happens here. I think this is wrong, because uh, we're not going. Oh, God, I wish this was fucking readable. Um. Hmm. Enter x dot. Did I implement a way of getting a record off of a field? No. So basically, we're going to, um, let's just think of a basic tree, draw it out a little bit, A, B, C, D, right? So here is our fancy tree. So what we would do is uh, two traverse is uh, traverse is equal to a. Then we'll have uh, it will become equal to an empty set. Technically, it's a stack. And then we'll have stack is equal to a. Okay, and then that will be a field structure. We'll serialize the record header, and then we'll go into, uh, then traverse will become, uh, in this case, we're going through each of the fields, so it will become B and C, and the depth is zero, zero, one B, one C. Then we will uh, pop, Traverse will become uh, 1B. Stack will become, so we continued to here. Last depth was not greater than depth. It was equal. Last depth was equal to depth. Last depth, uh, oh. This fucking wind, man. Um, if the last depth is greater than depth, and we'll track the depth, uh, last depth is zero, zero, zero. When this happens, it's still zero. Then we traverse into 1B. We push a 1B onto the stack. The last depth is still zero. We actually went down on the stack, which is fine, because we pushed. Uh, this will actually be 0a, 1b, traverse uh, 0. At this point, the stack gets updated. Traverse. Is it equal to empty? Stack is equal to OA, 1B. I need that to get popped off. I think it's greater than or equal to. I want to pop it off. That's kind of what I was wondering if I needed. Uh, let's... Uh, if let sum, 
if let self fields record fields trailing is equal to field it's like something like this Mm, all right. Expected tuple. Yep, depth. Throw the depth in the trash. Fuck. Um. Push those. Depth field. If depth is not equal to uh, if depth is depth is greater than depth. I don't know what I'm trying to do here, but this ain't it. I need to fucking think about it. Um, fuck. Okay, let's see. Hopefully. Okay. This one does not match. Sweet. So we can see what's happening here. Uh, what's this remix? Uh, this. Depth. This is t uh, stack dot iter map x collect into a vec zero one zero one two so basically if the last depth is equal to the depth that we just processed. I guess this is actually not what this would be. That should never happen. Push the depth plus one. So the depth of the current record, which is zero, If the depth, it's the same thing, but if the current depth is less than the last depth, how is that happening? If it's equal, how are we having dupes? What's the overhead on tuples and Rust? Zero. It's just the same as two values next to each other in memory. Okay, what dumbass thing am I doing here? Um. Two, three, f okay, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, f 14. Pff, 
Capri. Post. Yeah, they're always going to be identical. Um, so at zero, we process things. We add those to the queue. So if we have another list, which is the to traverse. Post. There we go. Now this has the data that I care about. OK. Zero, zero. Then we got to the end. We ended up pushing one node onto there. We then enter that node onto the stack. And that node pushes three things on the stack. We then. We then grab, um, we then go into the, f the last depth two, and we start processing it. We find out that that has a depth three. We then pop that and go into the depth three, which has two fours. We grab one of the fours. Uh, see that that has fives. Grab the five, see that that is six as we keep going for a long fucking time. Uh, I'm looking for when this flattens out. Okay. Boom, 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 boop, boop, boop. Okay. So this is the point where it gets interesting. So we have a bunch of 14s. I see. Here we go. So we're on the 13. We pop the 14, which is the last one. We find that that has nothing else. And somehow we don't pop that. I think we do. I want it post there. There we go. Okay, 14. So we post a 14, we then grab a 14. Uh, it didn't add anything. We had a 14. Oh. Yeah, I thought that seemed off. Um, if let's some stack. Uh, last is equal to stack dot iter dot um, I think next back. So get the current thing on the stack. If If last depth is equal to depth, then pop that shit. Right? Mm. I'll just deref it here. We no longer have that last depth. It's just the stack. Yeah, I don't know why I was using a last depth tracker. Clearly, that was stupid. I don't know why I suck at these traversals so much. I need to practice them more. Beautiful. If 
the last depth... If the last depth was greater than the depth we're pro um, No. No, 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 no. If the current depth is below the last depth, pop that shit. And I think I want to do it before. Do I just want to do it if it's less than? Yeah. No, no, that's fucked. God damn it. I suck at these, man. I can't do basic traversals. I have no idea why. Um, we did this the other day, too. It's so frustrating, man. Oh, I think my food's here. Let me check. Be right back. Oh my god, I have food. I'm so fucking excited. I'm starving. I'm the most hungry I've been in a while. Oh yeah. Oh fuck yeah, that's good. Okay. So what do we need to do here? Um, at the start, we have nothing to traverse, and we're at the zeroth node. After the loop, or after the processing, we've added we want to process one thing. Uh, we go into that stack. That's good. They definitely gave it the white spicy treatment, which makes me sad. Um, hmm. So how do I handle this? Uh, basically... There I push the three, four, five, all the way through. <clears throat> I'm not showing you weirdos my food. I'm just eating it because I'm hungry. I'm starving. What kind of food? Chinese food. I got like four or five different dishes. I'm just kind of eating a little bit of each. Mm. 
Hmm. So 13 comes in. Introduces a bunch of 14s. We pop a 14. The 14 adds nothing. We then go into another 14. And that's wrong. So we want it on equality as well. <clears throat> Is this correct? No. Um... Is it the location of the if? What dumb thing am I doing? I don't know why I suck at uh, recursive programming. Oh man, sun's out now. That's weird. The weather cannot make up its mind. Uh, okay. So, oh, yeah, I can't do that. Getting into Haskell opened my eyes to recursive programming, as you can't do loops in it, really. Huh. I've never done Haskell. Not a huge fan. So. The problem is <clears throat> when we get down to like this area, right? We don't want two 14s on the stack. And I don't know what the fuck I'm supposed to do about that. Hmm. Like, I actually have no idea. Stack iter next back. I think it's the position of this. Hmm. Do we do it? <clears throat> yeah. We go into the 14. It doesn't introduce anything. We're in the next 14. Yeah. I have no idea why I always get that wrong. <clears throat> Basically, I don't want to push it on the stack before I do that. Mm, what the fuck's going on down here then? I don't you watch your stream for a couple of weeks and you start working on AS1 parsers? What is this? Yeah, that's how it goes here. We're fuzzing some random shit. So we're, <clears throat> we're making an AS in one parser as part of the fuzzer. 
and right now I'm just struggling to do a basic uh, search. Ah, fuck. I should have saw that coming. We did it. <clears throat> we did it. 14, 14, consuming stuff off. <clears throat> That's what always gets me is that you have to check multiple layers up to see if you need to keep returning. Um, so then what I need to do is I need to serialize mm. if let some If let self fields blah blah trailing when I'm finally done with something pop push the trailing um Let's do... Yeah, I think this is right. Um... We have a depth that we throw away. Field. <clears throat> um, why though? <clears throat> so something in here is expecting that to be Ah, it's the first usage of it. <clears throat> um, stack is a vec of uh, I thir uh, view sizes and ref selfs. And it's a tuple. Noise. Um. Hmm. I 
Is that not right? Yeah, I've never done Haskell perf. I'd imagine it can be okay. It's a compiled language, right? I don't know why I wouldn't be able to have good language, uh, good perf. Kind of just up to the compiler. But are the compile times worth it? Well, I use Rust. Um... Ah. It's the last fields. Mmm. Mmm. Or we can just do... We got it. We got it. This is it. This is it. We just got to do the final. Just, uh, I got to do this. And we're good. And we're good. We're good. We got it. 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 That was fucking easy, chat. It only took us a half hour to figure out some basic shit. Um... Mm. Mm. What paren did I fuck up here? Because I definitely fucked up a paren. Uh, I don't see it. That builds okay. Or field in that. What? Am I going fucking crazy? How does that even work? What did we break? What? Whoa. Oh, I put it outside of the function like a fucking idiot. Wow. Yo, can we not can we not talk about fucking Java? Let's not let's not go down that path. That's just disgusting. Fuck. How is this not perfect? I know why. It's ordering. It's that right there. Bam. Done. Fuck. Yes! We did it. We implemented a basic 
fucking stack. Wow. Hell yeah. I need this. I have to need this, right? Yeah. Okay, it passes our tests. Um stack of nodes to explore. This is a stack of um, right. Eleven microseconds per file. It's kind of ass. This is um. Determine how many values to pop from the stack based on um, we want to pop any nodes which are um, yeah. This is, uh, <clears throat> we're shallower than this node on the stack. Get rid of it. And this is, hmm. There's got to be a better way to do this in Rust. Like, I can filter. I can filter the stack. Um. So we can do a stack dot retain X where the depth of X Um, if our depth is deeper, right? Yeah, same logic. Wow, a lot slower though. And that's because it can't early exit if I do retain. It can't terminate walking that stack. Unfortunately. I need, like, uh, retain until, right? That, it, that exists, right? Hmm. I actually like don't know how I want to do this. <laughs> I have to work on Android where the code base was created by enterprise Java devs. Yikes. <clears throat> that code is very Oracle. Even though it's not Oracle at all. It's very Oracle. 
Reading the fucking Android AOSP code is so fucking hard. Google's starting to favor Kotlin. Yeah, they have been for like two years. It's been the default project language in uh, the Android studio for a couple years now. It looks all right. Yeah. It's not terrible. Um... Hmm. Is there any way for me to do what I was doing before? Because this perf is ass, man. That's a huge hit. Like, what the fuck? Um... Hmm. I can't really do a take while because <clears throat> I don't want to take it off. All right. I could binary search it. I feel like binary search is worse um, just because it's very often that you're just, you're popping the most recent thing off. Is there a story about your Grizzly server? You just get it to experiment, or is it a cloud VM? It's just a server I bought, run it in my house, just for random compute and random research projects where I need something fun, something fast, something zoomy. Hmm. I could have it be a list of options and intermute and replace them with nuns, but that's stupid. Here's what we'll do. What sucks is that, like that's what I want, right? This is the problem is it doesn't know it's sorted. Dot iter. You know, a, a, a language would be really cool if you could annotate that, like, an array is always sorted. Like, imagine if you could say, like, always sorted vec, and it would know that if you're doing something like this, that the predicate, like, once it's been evaluated, evaluated once it can terminate, or if you're searching, it can do a binary search. Yeah, I... I think it was 18 grand for the server, something like that. Determine how many values uh, to pop from the stack. Um, okay. I think this will work in Rust. 
while um for depth uh uh last depth blah in stack iter reverse if last depth is less than or equal to uh, if it's greater than depth break dude the sun has been like beaming in my eyes and it's it just went away and i just realized how how dark the colors can get on my monitor for a second i just thought everything was uh blurry white okay if the depth uh enumerate uh, i fucking hate this man i might just do the retain but the but perf you know Truncate stack len minus i i. Something like that. Something like that. It's not it's not right yet. What do you mean can't DRF an integer? Just turn it into a pointer. Is that right? Is it right? I thought I needed a plus one here. I thought I needed this. But if this is wrong, then we'll think about it. God damn it, that's right too. Fuck! We have to do that, right? Do we have to do this? Yeah, we have to do that. 100%. Wait, what? I don't need any of this shit. The trailing is only present on the entire file. Yeah. Fuck. Well, then that's unnecessary. So is that. All we're doing is a traversal now. Let's get rid of this trailing shit. We're going to get rid of that logic for now, and then we'll add it back in a bit. God damn it. We're dumb as fuck. Gets rid of a lot of vector allocations, which is nice. Return the primitive. So that's where I actually want it. So we'll say uh, XXX trailing data. Trailing. And basically, anywhere that we return. God damn it. We got this fixed. I think someone asked about if I'm going to fuzz uh, Windows stuff for a fuzz week. Probably not, is the answer. Probably not. Traverse is self. At three fifty two. Yep, anywhere that we do a matchy boy. Is that the only spot? No, we definitely match in more spots. Like here. 
And here. Can we simplify that logic? Probably not. That code's perfect, right? That code's perfect. No flaws. Fuck yeah. Explicit panic. Print the number of matches. We probably have a couple. Nice. Do I just add it to the root level? Popped all, we made it back to the root level. Else if fields. This logic is pretty dank. Some impressive code there. Uh, fields in the file, and then we'll have a trailing trailing data in the file. Uh, Pink. Okay, obviously these it's field. Field ref self dot fields field field. Unless I want to implement this on field, uh, hmm, no. We're not going to get too object oriented here. Field, starting to get tired. Field. Bink. Beautiful. 351. Nice. Exactly how I wanted it to happen. ASN1 fields. Um, trailing is data into. Okay. Basically, if we have trailing shit, store that in there. Uh huh. 398. Let's do it again. ASN1 fields trailing uh, data dot into done done four twenty three. What's this? While this collapse everything down. Level remove zero. And so it's just the root level. And we grab the third thing. I guess in this case, level tracks multiple things. Last thing it tracks is the fields. So it's the top level fields. So this is while data.len is greater than zero. So what we can do is ASN1 fields level uh oops trailing uh vec new it's impossible that we have trailing data 
because the only way we got here is if all bytes are gone. So there's nothing left in data at that stage. 481 field. This is ASN1. Let's go. Let's go, baby. Fuck. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. That's okay. Um, out, extend, from, slice, self-trailing. Let's go. Yeah, buddy! Let's see how we're doing on perf, though. It's the real question. Ooh, 10 micros! Woo! That's good right there. Not perfect. We can make it better. We can make it better. Um... Let's see. Um, Do I want to do that? I, I'm like... There's no threading. I don't know how big these files are. I don't think they're that big on average. They're like a couple hundred bytes. Average size is probably like 50 bytes would be my guess. I mean, largely we're paying the cost of that comparison, right? Comparing the two buffers, right? Okay, apparently that's cheap. I'm actually kind of surprised. Huh. I would have thought that would be a bigger speed up by getting rid of that. Matches, and let's print the length of this. Buff len. How big is this buffer? Mm, some of them are relatively big, but yeah, a lot of them are pretty tiny. Hard to say what the average is. Probably, probably in the ballpark of 50. I don't know, that's pretty good perf. The only thing I'm thinking about doing is maybe uh, reusing allocations. Is there a link to a playlist? There's not. Um, parse those. Okay, we do an allocation for the stack. We do an allocation for fields that will get pushed as we parse fields. We have no option for that. Is that it? Is that it for vectors? We're pretty good on vex then. Vec new. Uh... I can cow the um this data. Right? Yeah. 
And can I Kyle Vec? I'm just trying to eek as much performance out of this as I possibly can. Field A. Uh, original file data. Vecca fields. This one can be cow. This one cannot. But this one could be a reference. Um, I don't know if I can actually cow a vec. Um... Two owned. So, two owned for that. It, oh, it's a VEC. Okay, so it, it does turn it into a VEC. So, a cowed slice turns into a VEC. Um. Bam. Let's go. Three fifteen. Let's move the data in. Obviously, that A is implied. Um, let me data is equal to a ridge. Slice up the original data. Bam. Okay. Hmm. Are we going to have lifetime issues here? I don't know if we will. I don't... No, uh, we might. Um, data in this case needs to be mute for all these. Data. Now, so that looks better. 344. Expected slice data. Dude, we got this. We got this. We got this. Uh...
dot when thank god for non-lexical lifetimes Let's see. Trailing. It's not borrowed anymore. Ah. Hmm. Doing one Vim window stacked on top of another terminal at the bottom? Yeah. Yeah, that's what I currently have. It's working okay. I can kind of go back to a side by side because I'm not actually uh, dealing with long output anymore. Move out of a ridge. So like in this case, 358, payload. Hmm. Urge must be borrowed for A. Yeah. I don't know if there's a good way to do this. I don't think there is. Hmm. What do I want to do here? Let's see. I can make the parser accept of ref u8, store the vec outside. Yeah. Hmm. 
Hmm. Kind of works okay. Let's try it. I think that matches up kind of with the previous model we had. An AU8, which is data. These don't have that anymore. Okay. Oops. Ref the file. Uh, I guess I'm consuming the whole thing, so I don't need to take that anymore. I can just do uh, let mute. Data is data. I slice up the original data, and then we have to kind of redo all of this. But it should just be those. Uh, 341. Bank. And then we can assert buff is equal to uh, file. Uh, files.lin. Five hundred. Ref buff. So is that actually doing borrowed right now? If we do data into, is that borrowed? Or does it go, uh, yeah, I think it is. So that just fucking works. That's fucking amazing. Yeah, into will operate on that, yeah. Oh, cow doesn't print the state, does it? Dude, that's fucking sweet, man. Like, we definitely got perf out of that. That is something dumb. No, maybe not. 10. Okay. Seven point eight eight three. Is it consistent? Mm, not really. Thanks, Linux. It's in the seven point eight range. That's pretty good.
A... <laughs> yeah, that might, that might be an interesting chat coming up here. Um, I'm interested in writing bootloaders and kernels lately. Do you have anything cool that I can learn from? Um, I've done a decent amount of uh, streams and stuff on OS Dev, but I don't really have any, like, clean materials to recommend. The Philop stuff is pretty good. It's okay. I don't do much conventional OS dev, so I don't always agree the most with a lot of OS dev manuals and stuff. So, um, so what do we want to do here? Where are we losing our perf, man? Pretty, it, it, it looks good. Like, it's looking good. Okay, what? Where's the cost? I mean, that assertion has a cost, of course. Six point five. Fuck yeah, that's just to parse it. And then serializing it, what does that change us to? Seven point eight. Okay, so most of our cost is in parsing. God, the variance, man, fuck Linux. Um, oh, yeah, parsing is not cheap. Like, these things are gross, man. Do you prefer BSD? I, I like FreeBSD more. Kind of forced to use Linux, but I think FreeBSD is cleaner. Obviously, the worst performance, and... Uh, less features, but I like, I like the code base a lot more. Get a bite. Fleeting zeros is less than seven, return none. Get the bits. Or it in, consume. <sighs> so... Check if we have room. So, I can track the, um, that leading zero count is expensive. I'm gonna get rid of it, just to see. It's negligible. Yeah, it doesn't matter. Okay, cool. So that's not the bottleneck. Um, consume. This is pretty clean here. And this is fairly clean. Once again, we'll get rid of the leading zero count. That's really the only thing that I can squeeze out of this more. Um, okay, so we're doing an allocation. And we can get rid of that. And this is, um, this 
how many allocations are we doing? Not that many. Uh, well, th we're doing about a million allocations. Uh, we're not threaded, so it shouldn't matter too much. That should be less than 5% of my CPU time. So... Can't see anything again. Something's right in my fucking eyes. Um... Push onto the level. If it's a constructed input, input put it on the stack. If it's a primitive type, must have a definite length. Uh, consume it, indefinite length, not valid. Track the number of bytes consumed, get the current level. Last, if there's nothing else left or at the root level, get the primitive uh, trailing. Oh, this can be cow. That can be cow. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> it was like, what the fuck? What was I doing? A785, is that a fluke? I think we I think we improved perf. Um okay, so that gets rid of another copy, and that leaves us with a couple more Vekis. Um output, output, output. So those are getting reused. Then we have this field, this level. Um, let's just try this. Uh, cache the allocation for the level parsing. So then we're gonna do this, bad boy. Uh huh. Um, self dot level dot clear. Uh, clear the level state machine. And it is a vector of length. You size? No, that's a length. Uh, an actual you size, a you size, and a field. Uh, is that a ref field? Yes. That's an A ref. Let's hope we make some progress here. Ah, uh, no, that's a real field. Okay, uh, let's think about this a little bit. Self level next back. Self, self. That's a lot of freeze for no reason. Um, I don't know if we're going to get anything out of this. Uh, We might be undoing all this, but we'll see. It's it's a shupel. Ah, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I missed the mute. I just I just threw down a random parameter for fun. <laughs> uh, 300. Expected lifetime parameter, of course. That's an AREF. 
Do I need that? Next back, top level. Self, level, push, length, zero, zero, I don't know, we can, it doesn't hurt. I don't know, this is technically better for perf. Self dot trailing. Let's go. Let's fucking go. Bam. Vet. Can we impl a cow like that? It's just the root level. 439, self fields. Um, self dot level zero. Uh, dot three. <laughs> uh, okay, and then we have a serialize. Fuck you. Yeah. Oh, Twitch will mute most of this VOD due to the music. That's part of the plan. Everything matches? Nice. We didn't really get any perf from that, did we? <laughs> we definitely would for threads. If we ran this threaded, I think we definitely have a speed up there. Um, clear the level state machine. We create a new vector here. Um, what if I pre-allocate for 16 here? It's hurting, yeah. Some of these are just going to new. Okay. I probably because I like the way you type smoothly. Smoothly, hell yeah. Windows is definitely not the best. I mean, Windows has has its merits. Windows is a nice OS. I think NoOS has the same kind of accessible tooling like debuggers and other virtual tools for sure. Windows is way ahead on that. It's Windows is so much better for development and like productive work.
the purpose of the project to speed up performance of certificate reading? No, it's so that we can uh, mutate certificates and make invalid certificates. Why do you want to have the VOD muted? Because uh, we're just going to upload it to YouTube without the music track. And we'll have a higher quality than the pleb tier bitrate that uh, you get with Twitch. It's just going to be better. <laughs> it's just going to be strictly better. Um, that's the new plan going forward. I'm, I'm recording at a massive bitrate locally that can go up to like 150 kilo, 150 thousand so 150 megabits per second uh if we really need to so basically it's a super dynamic bitrate uh for local storage and basically you should be able to see individual pixels of the font uh on the youtube upload it should be really 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 high quality video so not that the old ones weren't that high quality to be honest but um It's effectively lossless that I'm recording, and right now the we're up to five gigs on this VOD, and it's been five hours. So like, typically my VODs are are like forty or fifty gigs in the old format, but since I'm using a dynamic bitrate, a lot of times when I have just text on the screen, it just converges to zero, um, and the bitrate basically is non-existent. Um, I'm also recording higher quality audio, so Twitch is getting 160 kilobit per second audio, uh, but locally I'm saving all channels, microphone and uh, s desktop sound uh, as 320 as two different channels, so I have three channels in the output file, um, which means the audio quality will be better on the YouTube video. Basically, the, the image quality is going to be significantly better, and the audio quality will be significantly better. Uh, it's just, like, across the board improved. So. YouTube still does chroma subsampling, though? I, I think so. There will be, like, some distortion. But it, it should be pretty clean. I don't know. I'm just stoked because I'm not using my CPU to do it anymore. My CPU usage is so low. Like, my computer actually behaves like a normal computer. Depending on the popularity, YouTube will decide uh, if you stay pleb or go pro. Because uh, they re-encode to VP9 if it's good. Oh, interesting. Honestly, my videos have been pretty high quality on YouTube, so I haven't been too upset. All right, are we going to optimize this anymore? Are we happy with this? We got it down from, like, what, 12 is what it was? It's pretty good. 7.7 .7 micros each. Um, I'm going to do this. Matches plus equals... Um, Buff.len matches is uh, F64 divided by elapsed. Uh, oops. IT elapsed as seconds F64. So this is bytes per second. Hundred and twelve megs per second in that ballpark. That's pretty good. And it's mainly parsing speeds. So how quickly can we parse? This is what that'll tell me is how quickly can we parse uh buff.lan file.lan. So this is our parsing speed. Uh yeah, 140 megs a second. That's pretty fucking good. Um, definitely not perfect, but for pure safe rust, that's pretty good. Like, yeah, we haven't used any unsafe in this. Serializing is surprisingly fast. Serializing is incredibly fast, which is actually good. 
We actually don't care about the parse speed. We care about the serialized speed. So let's see how fast we can serialize. Um, like, actually, all we really care about is this. Uh, D there push uh, SN one dot serialize uh, dot push uh, SN one dot let's do that. If we successfully parsed it. Here, we'll do this. Uh, just for our testing, we're just gonna do that. And then, uh, IT, this should basically be instant. Uh, buffs not being used. So now we'll do four blah in zero to uh, four ASN in. This here, ASN1 dot serialize mute buff, buff dot clear. Um, clone 475. We mainly care about serialization speed, so this is what we are really worried about uh uh field what is a clone on a cow Um, keep it borrowed. Sick. Okay, so... Now we can do... Uh, we're calling them matches, but it's... Matches plus equals buff.len. So, serialized bytes. Oh, that's looking good. For blah and zero to... 100? Yeah, 100. Clear that out. Uh, ref this. Let's go. Woo! Let's add another zero so we have more time to warm up caches. Fuck yeah. 500 megs a second? That's good. I notice you don't pre-allocate your VEX with capacity. Is that not worth it? Uh, typically not if you're going to, like, it's, I mean, it, it depends. It, it's, I mean, that's the, the real answer is it depends. Uh, but in a lot of situations, the answer is, is no. It's, n it's not faster. So it, unless you know how many things you're going to allocate, it's not really going to make a difference, especially in something like this where the cost of growing the vector only happens once. So, um, like the, the allocation in this benchmark is probably one, one millionth of the cost of the benchmark. So it doesn't matter. Um, and that's typically how it works out. Okay. So. 500 megs a second. God, that's fucking sick. Um, elapsed, and then we can do, um, the files. The files plus equals one. Mm, 
the files over elapsed. This will be files per second. Yeah, 587,000 files per second. Oh, that's good. Dude, this like actually might be able to supply inputs every fuzz case. Like I thought I would have to only do this every couple fuzz cases. Dude, holy fuck. Yeah, I can probably serialize like 30, 30 million a second. It's still going to be like a quarter of my CPU time. Well, I only need to do uh, an eighth of that. Yeah, this is, I can do this every fuzz case. Fuck yeah. Dude, this is so sick. Holy fuck. Um, okay, so let's uh let's make a database of fields. Two days ago I got a screen like the one on the right. It was like, how does it help me? But you're using it, okay? In in what context? I'm I'm curious what you mean by that. How's chat doing? I'm sorry, I'm getting sleepy. I'm I'm losing my steam. I've been up since uh, a while. <laughs> a, a, a while now. Um, I basically did a Gentoo install this morning, and now I've been hanging out with chat. All right, so this is gonna be an ASN one DB. Uh. And we're gonna have roots vec field A. And this is our root level um, ASN1 files. Um. Okay, so we're gonna ignore all of this shit. And we're only going to look at, we're just gonna clone that. Nah, that's it, we're just gonna parse. And this is going to be a uh, parse and ASN1 file uh, from data into the uh, ASN1 database. So this is going to turn into a corporate corpus. Um, so when we return something, we're going to return self dot and here we don't care about performance too much. We're gonna say self dot roots dot push self level dot um, zero three clone. Uh, save off this parsing as a roots. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful. So let's see how many we have there. Uh, print asn1.roots. This is basically keeping track of all of the asn1 files that we parse. Um, obviously, we never hit that condition. We never had a file that just had 
um, data in it. We never saw it without a container. We never saw that as well. Okay, now I'm starting to get skeptical. What? What? How? What? Oh, I didn't pass it fucking files. Jeez. <laughs> okay, 4472. Sweets. So all of these should be contributing, 2823. Yeah, so we see a little bit of each. That makes sense. Um... Okay. Uh, tuple is... Huh? That's not going to be cow, is it? Um, hmm. I don't know if I need them to be cow. Wouldn't it be possible to have a Fubus Week 2.0 for Windows? We kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, the answer is no. Probably not going to do a Windows Fuzz Week. It would take more than a week. It's a lot of work. And there aren't really any good tools for fuzzing Windows. Um... I don't know, maybe I will have these cow. Yeah, because then I can clone the cow and then uh, two owned it. And Uh, those friends are good. Are these friends bad? Yeah, they're bad. Doop. 467. Root ID. Returns an option. No. There we go. Uh, root ID option use uh, size. We return an option. Okay. Uh, let's. Here we can do self dot roots get root ID dot zero. Uh, that'll get it as ref, and then we can do uh, self dot roots root id dot one, which is a copy on right. 
Uh, we should be able to ref that. We should be able to make it work. Nice job. Um, push that. Level zero three clone. Um, oh, if the length is zero, we panic, don't we? Due to this. Um, now we don't panic. 458. Expected field, yeah. 448. Some. Burp. Okay, so what I should be able to do now, uh, let me buff is vec new. Uh, SN1.serialize. Root ID zero to mute buff, buff clear, asserts file is equal to buff. Nice, and that's gonna fail, of course. I I this in files dot iter dot enumerate. Pass an I I, and hopefully that will be making a database of all the files, and it did. So. We've been able to round trip everything, and we also parse them, and we save all of the files that we loaded uh, in roots. Um, root level ASN1 files. These were, uh, this is a root object and trailing um, bytes from an originally loaded ASN1 file. Bam! If I have a C++ code base that reads packets from a socket and I want to fuzz it, where do I start? Ah, it's a fucking hard problem. Um, no one's really put much effort into that. Your best chance would be using libfuzzer and uh, basically instrumenting jamming a single packet in. But if you want to do multiple packets, uh, you're going to need to write your own har harness. Most of the fuzzing infrastructure out there has not figured out how to do uh, sockets yet. It's kind of sad. Um, a database of ASN1 files and components. Okay. Sun is killing me. It's right in my fucking face. It's been like that this whole time. It's brutal, man. I can't see my screen. I gotta be squinting. Paper called AFL Net about it. Yeah, it's meh. The approaches of most fuzzers is kind of mutually exclusive to network fuzzing. We've basically been building up kind of bad work in that direction. There's really nothing out there that's good for network fuzzing yet. It's just something that no one's really put thought into. We've been trying to solve a completely different problem, and uh, we're going to find out we made a mistake. Like a big fucking mistake. I think most of the fuzzing direction that we've gone down recently is digging a fucking hole. So that is actually a relatively nice research topic. I don't think so. 
It's not a research problem. Fuzzing is not a research problem. It's literally a fucking make the fucking code problem. Like, it. There's nothing about fuzzing that's really research. There's a couple, like, data structures and designs, but ultimately it's just fucking write code and do it. Like, actually implement things. Oh, there he goes, power again. Oh, this one's not looking good. Oh, this might be the end. Nope. We back. UPSs are doing overtime today. How's the battery looking? It's looking good. I thought it was the end. I thought we were doomed. Okay, so... Um, what I want to do is I want to make a database of all subcomponents. Um, to do that, basically any time, any time I make a field, mm, I'm going to do it at the end, I think. I might do it in bulk. Let's try this. It's going to look basically the same. Men research has been something you can be busy with and play around, not actually, actually academia. Oh, for sure. Network fuzzing is like the most important form of fuzzing. To be honest, there aren't too many attack surfaces that aren't fucking network. There's just not. <laughs> they're either like network or syscalls. And like, there, there is not that much surface that is strictly a parser of a single format with no conversation. It's just not... Not really how it goes. Okay, um... I'm gonna call her Shatter, because I like the name of that. Um... Creates a database of all... Created, uh, we'll figure out what we're doing first. Fields. Bam. Ah, oh, it's literally just this. Oh, we need that for traversal. Um, if let this is equal to field, uh, handle uh, recursion. Doesn't matter what order we do it in, so there's no reason to rev. I will keep rev because that's what we were doing before. Um, let mute components is equal to hash set new. Um, set of components. And do I want to use hash set? Uh, do I care about performance here too much? We'll go B tree set for determinism. Uh, use alloc collections, B tree set. I think it's uh, B tree set first and then B tree set. Oh, 316. Okay. Okay. Yeah, what's going on here? Definitely some printage. Uh, 478, 494, yep. Um, uh, DFS all nodes in the gra uh, in the tree. Handle recursion, so add those to the traversal thing, and then uh, add the fields to the um, sets. So components dot, uh, Insert field, and that's a ref. We've got no ord. We're going to need some ords going on now. Wow, I was thinking ahead. I, I knew it was coming up. Nice job past me. Wow, 
Fucking quality. Uh, just on field. Is that really that fast? Oh, we didn't fucking call it. <laughs> Shatter eye eye. This should get slow. Honestly, not too bad. Uh, roots. Um, components. I'm really impressed. Uh, and this is a uh, a set containing all components from roots which were shattered by shatter uh, this has all sub uh, components of the graph, and thus uh, of it's not a graph of the tree, and thus allows um, for deduping of unique features at any level of an ASN one file. I think I have to add another lifetime. Hmm. What happened to the terminal font? We switched to Gentoo and we uh, just picked this font because I kind of like it. Four eighty four. Uh, the lifetime cannot outlive the nonus lifetime of shatter. Yeah, I think we just need another lifetime. Uh, Or we have to do a B, where the cow data is a B ref. Uh, and this is B, and this is B, and this is B, and. B has to outlive A. Uh, and that's a B now. Hmm. Cannot outlive. It can't live longer than this. We gotta clone this. Yeah. I fucked up. 
We can't ref that because we can delete the root, and we actually do delete the root. So it's important um, that this is actually a field A uh, 496. Okay. I actually thought that's what I did, and uh, wasn't. Um, this needs to be a mute self. Yep, because we're modifying. Nice. 56,000 components. Beautiful. Okay, so now we basically have every single part, including the roots. Oh, that's fucking cool. So basically, um, this is going to uh, traverse the uh, root ID uh, ASN1 file and save all components of the uh, tree into self.components. This allows um, us to create a database with all sub-components uh, including root levels of the uh, SN1 file. Uh, TLDR uh, self.components um, contains every um, every uh, field uh, recursively in root ID, right? So it has every single field that is recursively present in root ID um, in there, which is so fucking cool. Uh, cargo check. God, that's good, man. So now what this allows me to do is um, we can now make, we can now create out of thin air, we can create ASN1 files, right? Um, we can basically use our database to randomly mash things together. Um, and yeah, that will make us ASN1 files. <laughs> So let's try it. Um, uh, mutate. This is going to be self. Um, we're going to pass in a mutable reference to a... How do I want to mutate this? Um, mute vec, no, uh, mute field a, uh, b. We actually don't care uh, about the association of the lifetimes there. So it can be a completely different one. So what we're gonna do is um, let uh, temp is equal to, so we'll have the roots and the components, and then using the ASN1, we're going to make uh, roots get uh, 45 unwrap, so basically uh, get a uh, random ASN1 uh, root and clone it. Um, then we're going to call ASN1 mutate mute temp, right? So we have basically our local copy, and then we want to mutate it. Oh, God, how do I, how do, I do this in a performant way? So creating that database, I don't care about the performance so far, because that's done once when we start the fuzzer. Um, but this is going to be done every fuzz case. So this is where we really need to be careful about performance. Um, God, we're going to do a lot of allocations, aren't we? Uh, um, mute this. Okay. Um, so what we can do is...
we can... We need to do another traversal. And we need, need to make, basically, random decisions uh, to replace components with subcomponents. I'm just going to try this quick. Uh, I'm just going to see what uh, ASN1 looks like. It should be... Uh, yeah. So that's a good-looking file. Sweet. Um... Okay. To traverse vec new. To traverse plus equals ASN1. So, how do I do that? Uh, no return value. Difference in mutability on um, this stage. That's true. Yeah. Oh. Components. Bye bye. Yes. Okay. Um. So this means I'm doing a traversal. Uh, this is gonna go through every node. Uh, in ASN one. So we'll see every field. Yeah. It's literally everything. Um fuck yeah. Okay, so uh we need an RNG quick. Um Hmm. So this we're gonna create once this database um, serialize. Let's go for a little ride up to field. Impl a field a. Uh, pubfn serialize self. And we're going to serialize to buff mute vec u8, which is the output. Um, and it's just going to be self. And then uh, we can worry about trailing data on our own, I guess. Uh, serialize a field recursively to buff. Beautiful. We'll say out. We'll handle trailing data somewhere else. To traverse push field. Ah, uh, not double ref. There we go, 343, always succeeds, 480, gone, 537, just get rid of it for now. Okay, parse everything and shatter them up, and now we can do temp serialize, mute buff, let mute buff is vec new. Uh, standard FS writes test. Um, so we're going to serialize that out. What are you building? We're like an ASN1 fuzzer. Something that can load and deserialize and serialize ASN1 files and mutate them. Um, 
Okay. 027 ECA? Yeah! It's the same file. Fuck yeah! I'm gonna make a comment of the uh, unmodified MD5. But yeah, XXD test. That's effectively. There's the file. Um, and what we want to do is mutate using self. Mm, do I want to go the other way? I don't know. Um, I need to get an RNG into here. Uh, struct RNG U64. Uh, Impl RNG FN Rand. Uh, this will have a U size. We'll do U size. Uh, mute self. Uh, let's mm, seed is equal to self dot zero self dot zero uh, seed thirteen seventeen forty three uh, seed. Okay, so this is a uh, get a random number. Great. Okay, uh, let me mute. Uh, that's a random number. Honestly, we can just use par list. Let's just grab uh, 16 bytes there. Done. There you go. There's a random seed. How convenient. <laughs> Mute RNG. Oops. Mute RNG. Okay, so that's looking pretty solid. Um, so when we're going through these fields, uh, before we actually push a field for traversal, um, we can actually replace it. We should be able to do field is equal to uh, field um, field Vec new, not ballpark. So we're just basically replacing all fields. Uh, expected two arguments. Yeah, I forget what's actually in a field. Uh, we have a record. Oh, yeah, that's kind of important, isn't it? <laughs> record. <laughs> Let's just try it. Uh, you know what? It might be easier to just do this. Um, field is equal to ASN1 dot and fields itself is a field too, which is kind of fun. Um, uh, self is the ASN1. We have a components dot len. Uh, let cell is equal to self components len. We're just gonna do uh, self or rng dot rand mod this. Get a random number. Field is equal to self dot components um, cell clone. Fuck. I need, um... I need this in a vector. Um... A vector of all the components so that we can index it by, uh, index it. Uh, into its okay. Uh, components dot insert self components vec push field clone. 
Okay. Is that the only place? Yes. Uh, 519. Components. Vec. I know we're doing double copies of things, but whatever. Yeah. So that is not good for lifetimes. Mm, yeah. So... I can't get those on the same ref. I mean, this will work, but it won't work multi-threaded. Um, well, let's check it. Yeah! There's our, there's our random file. Yeah! Fuck yeah. Uh, plus instant now. Eh. Um, fuck yeah. Dude, that's so cool. That's so fucking cool. Um, wow. Wow. <laughs> That's so fucking cool. Uh, Prince. We'll just hex print it in uh, Rust land. O2x buff clear. Whoa, let's go. So these are kind of randomly generated inputs that are always the same. Self. Ooh. Yeah, no shit. Uh, self set zero. Uh, since I don't care about the performance, I'm just going to do this for now. Yeah. So this, these are just random ASN1 things where we just splice together the random subcomponents. Um, now the problem is it doesn't resemble the original input uh, very well. So let's just go to 5 and then we'll say um, print ridge this um in this case it's just files i i we can we can just do that in this case or sorry 45 okay so the original is this 308006 and we'll always have the same 3080. And uh, that's kind of due to a weakness in our mutation. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to do our traversal. We're going to pop the field. So this is a mutable reference to the thing. And we're going to say if we can just do it here. If rng.rand mod 16 is equal to zero, then replace it. Have a one in 16 chance of replacing something in there. Okay. Uh, 
Um, we're gonna go with a one in four chance, but basically for every node that we traverse, we're gonna have a one in four chance of replacing it. Oh, that's so fucking cool. Dude, this is sick. So basically here's the original, right? And we can see that this one spliced in, it, it spliced in something that made it significantly larger, but it's still a valid ASN1 file, right? Everything here is a valid ASN1 file. Um, we somehow replaced it with a zero two times in a row, uh, bad luck. Um, then here we have it again. You can see it's very similar to the original, 308006, and then we have an 092B06, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then an 07. Okay, we, we replaced a pretty high level in the tree. Uh, what about this one? Here. Oh, we're mutating in place. Um, so what we're gonna do is, uh, we're gonna refork the original every time just so we can see better what it looks like. Uh, okay, here we go. So now we're building off of the original every time. Nice. So you can see they resemble closely, they often resemble the original input, uh, 30806026. And basically what we're doing is at the tree or graph level or whatever you want to call it, we randomly splice in uh, known good values. Now, uh, RAN32 probably makes more sense here. Um, it's going to decrease the amount of corruption, so a lot of them will come out looking identical. Um, we're going to do, like, mod 16. Fuck yeah. Yeah, look at this. We spliced in almost like a whole file in the middle of that. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Yeah, these are all, basically, these are slight variants of the same input, right? That's effectively all we've done is we've, we've just made it so we mutate slightly and then re-emit it as a new ASN1. Uh, so what we're going to do is... Um, uh, open SSL ASN1 parse, and ASN1 parse should dump uh, the stuff out. So let's give it a try. We're gonna say uh, dir encoded uh, inform dir in test. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically dumping kind of the the actual uh, thing. So what we're gonna do is just uh, uh, standard fs write test buff unwrap, um, and then we'll do a process uh, use standard uh, process command command new open SSL args some of these bad boys dot uh, status unwrap and then we'll do sn1 parse inform dir what are we trying to do we're working on making a fuzzer for asn1 files uh, dash in test okay I should be ballpark correct Yeah, so this is printing, um, print open SSL outputs. This is printing the mutated version. Or it's basically passing the mutated version into open SSL. And we can see that it's splicing in valid shit. Like, all of these are, are parsing. They are valid um, ASN1 files. Like, yeah, look at this. We, like, spliced in this shit somehow. <laughs>
Yeah, here we spliced in a, a pub key. Um, we're basically creating new ASN1 things out of the, the, the corpus files that we've seen historically. Oh, fuck yeah. That's so cool, man. Fuck yeah. Prime field. Oh, it's beautiful, man. And they're they're valid too. They're valid. I guess the lengths are gonna get fucked, aren't they? Cause we don't fix up lengths, do we? Um, I don't, I don't think anyone's making funny DJ. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that's what's happening. Um, hey, on Unforgiven, how's it going? Don't you ever have to work? Nah. Okay. So I think we don't do lengths correctly. No, we do. We do because we never Oh, maybe not. Because we can replace... Basically, if a sequence has a fixed length... Uh, yeah. Okay, we will we will break lengths. We don't correctly fix up lengths right now. But it's okay. It's acceptable. You see a lot of the same shape over and over because that's the, the root file that we picked. Right, if we were to change the mutation amount to a 50% chance of replacing a part in the graph, we'll probably see a lot more, yeah. We see like much different things. Illegal zero content, yeah. So basically we see a, a shit ton more variance because we're now like creating kind of more new uh, ASN1 files, if that makes sense. Why don't you have schedules? Because I got, I got a lot of shit going on in my life. I can't, I can't really plan my, uh, I can't plan my streams. The streams are just for fun. It's a hobby. Other things come first. Mainly, uh, my WoW raid. That's priority. Okay. So... Basically, sequences, I have a chance of replacing them. Most sequences will be infinite. But yeah, end of contents, end of contents, end of contents. Yeah, I don't know. This is probably acceptable. Like, this probably isn't too bad. So what's the largest one that we produce? How how quickly are how quickly can we make a million of these first? Okay. We're doing a lot of clones right now and a lot of splicing. Those clones are not cheap. Fuck. Fuck. I mean, that wasn't terrible, but it's also a relatively small input. I mean, we're doing a lot of mutations. Let's go to uh, 16, one in 16. They should speed it up. We're mainly just doing traversal traversals. 
Oh, that wasn't bad at all. It took like three seconds to do a million. We're doing like 300,000 a second. Okay. Times uh, 96 cores. Yeah, I don't think this is going to be a terrible bottleneck. I think that's pretty good. Uh... Okay, let's go into... Um... Let's make this work on a folder. Uh, standard FS reader of sheet uh, fuzzer. P as ref path Erg dot ref dot path. File name, file name, uh, load all input files. Bam, bam. You know what? We're going to do that. In the other spot. Okay, so we can implement defaults on that. Uh, we want access to the roots. Let's fucking go. Dude, we got this. We got this. Um, how's my RNG laid out in this? Ah, uh, we can give it a fucking closure. I don't care. Um, Rand is a uh, where f is a function which returns a u size. Unterminated block comments. I agree. Consider adding a main. Main source lib. Cargo build release. We can make this no standard. Fuck yeah. Use alloc vec, vec, fuck yeah. Um, for now, we're just gonna make um, pub asn1db. And pub mutate. Pub shatter, pub parse. Can't leak a private type, uh, which is a field. Ooh, 
Bam. Which has a record. It's turtles all the way down. Now it's not. Nice. That's a fucking library. Okay, um, mutate ASN1 into a new file. Mutate ASN1 into, uh, by uh, corrupting it at the graph level. Cargo Tommel. We're going to pull in uh, ASN1 parser from path is equal to ASN1 parser. Okay, cargo sh deploy. Nice. Now what we're gonna do is um, this is a database of ASN1 inputs. Um, ASN1 DB is an ASN1 DB. I think is what we literally called it. We're gonna use from um, ASN1 parser ASN1 DB. Sick. Missing a lifetime parameter. I can't put a lifetime on global context. The cow might be going out. Um, in band lifetimes. Um, ASN one DB. So how the fuck? How do I erase those lifetimes? And I can't. Oh, that's a mess, man. I mean, in the current form, I'm technically not really using the lifetimes. Unless there's a better way for me to do that, but I'm not aware of one because I need to have the lifetime on that structure. I don't have a good way of deleting them. But honestly, that should be effectively the conversion. Like that should get us most of the way there. Obviously we don't need these uh, lifetimes. It won't make a huge difference at this level of optimization. Um, so it's not too big of a deal. Okay. Um, this is going to be load. Uh, oops. Load the corpus. So this is the previous corpus loading. Get rid of it. Let mute ASN1 DB is equal to ASN1 DB defaults. Now 
Nice. Okay, um, for fn, or file name, and standard fs reader inputs, unwrap, file name is equal to file name unwrap path, let file is equal to standard fs read file name unwrap, uh, print loaded blah file name okay and then we can do uh, sm one db dot uh, I think it's parse and then shatter parse file sn one db shatter All. Pub fn shatter all. Mute self. Option. Uh, go through all root asn1 files in the uh, database and shatter them. Uh, for id and zero to self dot roots dot len self shatter shatter ah id okay bam Okay, so load everything. Obviously, we didn't have any inputs. So we're gonna, uh, we gotta scoop them. Ah, oh, they're actually an ASN1 parser. Scoop the inputs recursively to Grizzly. Fuck. Uh, soft serve deploy. Okay. We don't want those inputs. We want these inputs. These are the good ones. Okay. Home pleb inputs. Okay, you get the path. I don't understand how that was building before. Okay. Fuck yeah. Uh, yeah, this will return the number of shattered things. That'll be fun, right? Uh, Self.roots.lin. Uh, print shattered blah sn1 files four thousand fuck yeah all right what's our coverage looking like let's run this for a second we'll see uh we'll see what coverage looks like it should be absolute dog shit that's what I want to see here. Yep, looks like absolute dog shit. So this is the current line. It's one of the lowest lines on the graph. Higher on the graph is better. So um, obviously it's doing terribly. Uh, good to see, good to see. Okay, that means it might be working. So what we're gonna do
How do you get those code coverage stats? What do you mean? Like, uh, how do I display them with GNU plot? Um, how do you actually get the coverage data? I mean, I, I'm running it in my own emulator. I, I literally just track what I'm executing. I can do whatever I want. And that's pretty much what I do. I just track it as I emulate it. I track what code I've executed. Um, okay. Here's what we're going to do. Uh, let me test in is equal to global context sn1db dot roots I need like rand root or something like that dot line I should have access to roots I do um, let's our uh, root cell is equal to uh, VM RNG mod uh, VM Rand uh, mod global context ASN one DB roots len roots root cell clone uh, clone a random ASN one roots fuck yeah. I'm going to do this in this case. Input dot clear. Input extend from slice. Test input. Size is equal to test imp dot len. Uh, I got to do uh dot zero. Um test uh test imp serialize mute inputs. Okay. And this is just Input dot len. The source of your emulator is online, right? Th this emulator is not. This one's not open source. Mute. Uh, we can just do this. This looks fun. Hell yeah. Hell yeah, it's fun. Test imp doesn't need to be mute. Perfect. Len is 200, indexes uh, that on 289. Uh, understandable. I think that's because we're not adhering to uh, buffer size. So we'll do input, resize, buffer size, uh, zero. So resize it to buffer size. Hopefully this doesn't have that same issue. It does not. Sweet. Oh my god. No fucking way. Did that really get me that much coverage? Holy shit. And that's only one input. It only ever does that once. Um, if zero so we have a 50 percent chance of building on an existing input 
And what we'll do is vm.randmod2. So if mod2 is 0 and this input also exists in the database. So now we will use more from the database. We're not actually mutating yet. Well, we are mutating by byte flips, but we're not mutating uh, using our in-place mutator. Okay. How's perf doing? Perf's doing okay. Yeah, perf's doing just fine. Um, it's basically identical. Uh, and that's what I would expect. I would expect it to basically be identical, because at this point, we're basically, in a very l long way, we are uh, basically, um, yeah, we're, we're effectively just passing in the input corpus. So now what we're going to do is um, asn1db.mutate. Uh, vm.rand, basically a closure that allows me to get random numbers, and then the uh, test input. And now we're actually going to be mutating. Holy shit. That just all plugged together? Is this going to crash? I don't expect us to get more coverage. Seriously, I, I don't. Um, mainly because there's really not much more coverage to be had. <laughs> there's just not much that we can do there. <clears throat> I would be really impressed if we get more coverage, but I think we're just literally capped out on the amount of coverage that we can possibly hit. Okay, mod 16. Let's just do mod 1. Uh, this is just going to massive. This is just going to thrash the shit out of these uh, inputs. And this might hurt coverage because we never make a valid enough one. Yeah. Okay. Okay, nice. That's looking good. We're hitting coverage. Obviously, it's taking longer to get that coverage, but that's A-OK, -okay, because we're hopefully making more malformed inputs now. Nice. Yeah, our coverage will be significantly lower. Um, and that's just because we're mutating so much. Uh, let's do, um, let's mutation frequency is equal to, um, rand mod 64 plus one. And then we can do rand mutation frequency. Um, pick a frequency of corruption. So we'll have... Uh, a 1 in 64 chance that we corrupt the shit out of it, and almost everything is corrupted. Um, but we'll also have a 1 in 64 chance that we only corrupt every 64 entries. Uh, which will give us a good chance of just leaving an input as is, without uh, major corruption. What are you doing? We're working on a fuzzer right now for uh, an X59 parser. Holy shit. That covers looked good. Maybe, maybe I'm just seeing things. Honestly? Honestly? That's looking nice. Uh, performance? 30% of our time is working on fuzz cases? That's A-OK -okay if we make good cases. If we're making good cases, we can, we can spend those cycles. Um...
Okay. Are you working on a fuzzing tool? Yep. That's what we're doing right now. I'm just impressed with this fucking target, man. Fifty three hundred coverage. Now we're probably not benefiting as much from feedback. Um I mean we can just go find another ASN one parser. <laughs> This looks pretty damn good. I know we can eke out a little bit more coverage in here. I think I've seen like just a little bit more than this. But yeah, we're pretty much maxed out on coverage. Um, and that lines up with what we see in Binja, right? If we take a look, right? It's like there's a couple where we don't hit air paths, but we can't because we literally can't pass null to this because we're not using it. Once again, can't pass null to this. Otherwise, 100%. Uh, can't hit this. Can't hit this null check. Otherwise, 100% coverage. Uh, pop already at root. We can't hit that. Um, too many directory names. Okay, we probably could hit this coverage. If we heavily repeat a field... We probably can get that. What is the input being sent to the application? And it's an X509 file, which is an ASN1 uh, dir encoded file. It's basically a TLV. God, this wind, man. It does not end. All right, be right back.
Alright, let's find another ASM1 person to fuck up. We've got pretty much 100% coverage on this. It's not really fully parsing ASN1 files, so... It's gonna be hard to find anything too crazy. And also, the code quality, honestly, was pretty, pretty fucking good. Um... Let's go, uh, find one. Hack me, bro? Here you go. Here's your hack. Ready? Ready? Hit it. <laughs> Later. <laughs> Fuzzy going burr right now? It, it did. We did a couple million cases. Holy shit, couple billion cases? Really? That was 2.6 billion cases? Jesus fucking Christ. Yeah, this fuzzer's kind of fast, man. <laughs> this fuzzer's ridiculous. How long does it take us to hit that coverage? <laughs> see, you, see you around, Napalm. I'll check out the uh, Discord thing soon. Let's take a look at um, S1 to 3 with 2 to 3. <laughs> we hit basically, we hit full coverage at, uh, it's, okay, this clearly does not work in log scale on this uh, format. Uh, we, we hit full coverage in, like, 11 seconds. <laughs> Literally, the cost of this is just, like, jitting it, man. We just immediately get full coverage. Holy fuck. Well, uh, yeah, let's... Uh, <laughs> oh, the classic. I love Vekimu, man. Two to three, the one to three. Okay. <laughs> God, that's insane. How many cases were we doing a second? Six million a second. So the one second mark is... Uh, two, three, four, five, six. We almost hit full coverage in a second. We get like 98% coverage in a second. <laughs> um God damn it, that's good. What do we get if we don't do any mutation? I don't, I don't know if we're benefiting that much from mutation, to be honest. The ASN1 uh corpus is probably relatively good, but we're gonna try this is gonna be zero mutation. Literally. No mutation. It's just feeding back effectively inputs from the corpus. Oh, shit. Okay, we're getting a lot from mutation. Whoa! 2855? Okay. How much do we get from this mutation versus the bite flips? Yeah. Oh, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's getting us more coverage than the uh, original input set. And then obviously the byte flips are important as well. Um, and the dictionary, of course, is also really important. Um, we technically should have that uh, those... OIDs should get jammed into the dictionary or into the um they should we should basically cleanly inject those OIDs and I think we'd get a lot more coverage faster not that it matters we're we're basically uh hitting full coverage so we're going to find an ASN1 parser on GitHub um 
the ASN1 compiler. Generate C++ compatible source code. That... What? What? <laughs> Takes an ASN1 module file and generates C++ compatible C source code. <laughs> you what, mate? <laughs> you what? So this is ASN1, this is not X509. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, does it take an ASN1 file? Is that it? It just takes an ASN1 file? Oh no, it don't do me like this. For Burr and Zur encoding, Indie code, okay. Um, encoders and decoders out of formal ASN1 specs. So you basically make the spec and then it makes the encoder decoder. Interesting. Okay. Um, not really what we're looking for. Let's find that good, good C. There's asinine. SM2. Oh, no. Uh, what? This is something else. Yeah, that's not going to do shit. That's using some library. What's it linking against? LSSL. Yeah. What's this? What's this? Um, what's, the fuck is this? What is this? <laughs> Libs? I didn't see a library thing. What the fuck is this? ASN1 compiler that targets C and ADA. So I guess people just compile these ASN1 specs so they can parse their shit. Oh, this looks good. Oh, yeah. 
<laughs> okay. This just never happened? Lib ASN1? <gasps> Generated by ASN1C. Ooh! So this is... Oh, jeez. It parses everything. But it's all generated. I kind of wonder if the generated stuff has bugs. A very simple, specific purpose ASN1 decoder. <laughs> okay. Okay, <laughs> let's... Oh, baby. What the fuck? Why is it... Why is it using end curses? What's this fancy shit? Oh, sprint up with a prick. Uh, a pre. That's impressive. Okay. I don't think this actually does the encoding or decoding. Maybe it does. Uh... Oh, yep, there we go. Next. Oh, it's in a global. <laughs> oh, oh, geez. Oh, are those go tos? Oh no. Oh no. Okay, where's the fucking parser? Print usage, get by name. I could see bugs existing in this. I could see bugs existing in this. Find matching tag. I don't know, maybe not. Nothing's like egregious. So it returns an object, takes an ASN1 type. It recursively calls itself. Oh, there's stack exhaustion. Run interactive. Start type. Type. Start type name. Zero, zero, zero. Okay. Because you pass an argument via global, don't you? God damn it. It literally is just... It, this whole thing's bolted together with globals, isn't it? Where is it? Where's the global? Yep. <laughs> God fucking damn it. Don't do that! Don't <laughs> use globals, man! You don't need fucking globals for everything. Uh, we'll keep moving on to something a little bit uh, more. Lib security ASN1. <sighs> Apple computer? 2004? It fucking looks like Apple code. <laughs> That's for damn sure. Holy shit. Cool. Decode. Source line template. ASN1 decode. Dirty code of an untyped item. 
So what the fuck is this? Should we fuzz this? Why does this exist? Like, what is this from? I mean, I would suspect there's going to be some bugs in this bad boy. I mean, not because it's written by Apple, but uh, because it's written by Apple. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, roughly ballpark of what this looks like. Oh, this looks juicy, man. Decode. Buff and a len. Decoder start. This code is disgusting to look at. I don't know how people write code like this. Um, decoder update. Buff. If statuses need bytes, keep going. Consumed. I'm just looking to see if they do length checks here. Do they check length? If length is zero, need bytes. Byte is equal to DRF buff. Okay, that's in bounds. That's in bounds. <laughs> That's some debug shit, okay. So we have a bite. Let's see if we use buff again. No. Parse identifier. Oh god. Wait a minute. Do they... Do they handle every single byte with the state machine? The whole thing's a state machine, isn't it? They don't actually, like, read the byte. They literally do every single byte, and then they read a byte and update the state. And then they read, oh god. Oh, jeez. My hopes are not high for this code. Let's find, no. Where's that count from? While len and status pending, count plus plus. Read the byte. Okay, that's in bounds. That's in bounds. Yeah, I fuck with that. That's respectable. Uh, parse length. Inbounds. And then state machine. God. I don't know how people write code like this, man. While in and that. Parse more length. Um, the high bits are not equal to zero. Oh, it even checks for the overflow. Yeah, that's respectable. Oh, what's this? Oh, that's prepare. Okay. Um. Indentation seems so random. This is normal. This is pretty standard for code bases. Um, buff len is len. <gasps> oh. 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 
what's the length of data? I don't see a check. Where's this fucking item? State dest. Ooh, plus item length. Ah. Uh, That doesn't look good. That doesn't look good. If item length is zero and if it's an integer and the length of the item is zero, then copy into item data for len where len is literally fucking controlled. I'm guessing in this case. Yeah, bit string. I think that's game over right there. Then again, everything's a state machine, so I don't know. I feel like that's uh that might be game over. <clears throat> that might be our heap. We could maybe try and get that to build. I I kind of want something simpler. Let's see this one. Okay, when I see all caps, this is the compiler, dude, isn't it? Is this generated code? Oh! Oh, this looks fun. This looks really fun. Oh, this looks super fun. Um, where's the decoder? And how do I build it? Did this person fucking upload binaries? Yes, they did. <laughs> <laughs> dir encoder I want a dir decoder I love seeing dados on GitHub yeah oh god I mean this code looks very uh, Unix-y and Unix code is uh <laughs> Not the best. So it's per. X691, what did we implement? X690. There's bird decoder. Pointer size. Mm, fetch tag. Ooh. This looks like bugs. But I also don't see where I'm going to pass shit in. Oh, no. There's no bounds check on that. There's no bounds check on the advance. Now, there's a chance. There's a chance that they check the lengths before they do this. And they don't deref anything. And they bounce check everything. Right... Rom. <laughs> I feel like it's, uh, I'm going to press X to doubt there. Still, let's keep looking around at all of our options. Oh, baby. Uh, 
Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna hazard there's bugs here. <laughs> I, I haven't, I have not seen too many bounce checks. <laughs> if the length is less than or equal to zero, get out. And then just, okay, hmm. Oh, this could be fun. Oh, yeah, baby. Oh, there's some copy pasted code. Oh, yeah. Oh, that looks good. Oh, beautiful. Who even heard of a for loop, man? <laughs> oh, oh, this looks good. All right, I think we can find a bug in this one. Woo! Dir to OID. <laughs> just fucking, just, just stack buffers all over the place. Oh, fuck me. All right, how do I parse? Cert parse? P7B cert parse? Uh, this is the output object? Oh, 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 the mem copy is all over. Oh, baby. Don't do me like that. What the fuck are they doing? Make time into... Oh, oh this looks fun, man. <laughs> you found Huawei code. Um, let's fucking, let's do it, man. This just looks fun. I'm all for it. Let's fucking go, baby. <laughs> I love getting shit to work. Just random projects. <laughs> let's fucking go. Uh, I love how there's no make file. You just have to make it work yourself, but that's fine. That's what I'm here to do, baby. This ain't my first fucking rodeo. I can get this shit working all day. Boo! Linked, baby! Hee-hoo! <laughs> God, I'm so fucking good at code, man. <laughs> Wait, is that executable? <laughs> Beautiful. Must this be a decoder for IoT? <laughs> Oh, oh, let's hope so. Okay. Um... Fuck yeah. <laughs> oh! <laughs> I'm so excited! <laughs> I'm so excited for this, man! Do you think it's this? Do you think it's PB7 cert parse? So it takes a pass and... And then it 
Obj to string, der? What do you think I need to do with this uh, .o file here? Or this under o? Um... If it's not equal to null. Oh! I can just give it null, can I? I can just give it null. Is that the classic? You just give it null and you're fine? Right, so we see like... User search from P7B. Dir in, dir len. Dir out. P out, dir len. X509 cert parse. Where was that? That exists here? <laughs> and that makes an obsers. I don't know what it does, but it looks great, man. This looks f fantastic. This looks wonderful. Let's call let's call this function. Um sn one opera dot h. Uh, let's call this asdf four uh, char buff four mm, buff four. No bugs for sure. Make file, uh, all gcc g main.c asn1 opera.c lm. I think they used math. What were they doing pow for? I can't wait. Um, oh, output durlan. Wait, what's dur out? Oh, fuck. <laughs> you, you don't give it a length? You don't give it a length? Ah, woo! You give it an output. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, baby. Don't do me like this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and it uses it unconditionally, so this pointer has to exist, and it sets the length to what it's about to memcopy in, and it has no idea what the length is. <laughs> Let's get Google to translate so I can see what the the spec is for that. Let's see what they say here. Uh, so return zero on success. And it finds the user certificate and then copies the user certificate out. Oh, baby. <laughs> ah! Ah! <laughs> and it ate? Why? <laughs> no. No. Oh, my God. Do I just comment out the mem copy at the end? Okay, does it use this internally? If it, yeah, it does, there's no references to this. It is intended that a user uses this function. <laughs> this is, uh, this is a user facing library. Oh, well, we're gonna be able to, we're gonna see if we can find a, a buffer overflow in this. So we're gonna make, <laughs> we're gonna pass a, um, we're gonna pass, <laughs> We're gonna, we're gonna pass a, a zero byte buffer to buff, 
<laughs> because that's allowed. <laughs> and then, uh, like, is there supposed to be a fixed size for this? <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Okay, so let's just pass this, uh... Uh, char foo. I will put it right on the stack. And, uh, int. Mm, outland. Yeah. Outland. <laughs> there we go. We're, we're, we're using their library. <laughs> I, I think we're going to be able to find a bug. I'm still confident this code base is safe. Okay, so what do we do here? Um, I guess we can just pass all these args. We can just call this directly. We're 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 smart enough. Oh man, King G one two three. Is watching and crying right now. No, man. No. Sometimes you just gotta write code quick, man. I'm not. I'm not judging the quality of the developer. I'm judging the speed of which the code was developed. I feel the same. This is unbreakable. <laughs> if it's a bug, you're using it wrong. Well. All right, guys. Let's. Let's take bets. How many bugs are we gonna find? Unique bugs. How many bugs? Fuck, I got something in my eye and it hurts. Zero. Zero bugs. <laughs> okay, bunch of memers in chat. Uh, will we have a bug that results in code execution? Will we have a bug that results in, in control of PC? Yeah, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, might, I might have to side with you there. Uh, let's go. Let's get this running. Oh, gee. Statically linked? Hell yeah. Okay, so we're gonna scoop uh, this out to Grizzly. Milky Dev, holy shit, thank you so much for the raid. Damn, dude. Fist powder, all y'all too. One, two, three in the name. I'm voting 123. We're uh we're looking for bugs right now. He hasn't noticed keep on attacking. I'm terrible at checking chat. I'm a piece of shit. <laughs> um okay, so we just need to find this function. We need to make a harness for it. Um, where did, oh, here, okay, uh, let's just go, let's make a harness for this, dude, there's no way, there's no way that there's any bugs in this code, uh, uh, Let's first make sure we can load that elf. Address of is gonna fail. Failed to get an entry point. Entry point is now this. We're passing a buffer and a length, baby. Is that it? Is that all we needed to do? <laughs> uh, uh, 
I mean, maybe we did something wrong. Maybe, maybe we, I mean, we don't pass in the other two args right now. Like, so technically, te technically, technically, I'm just going to pass in, I'm going to pass in an invalid pointer, dead, dead, uh, to both of these. These are args three and four to the function. So, uh, we have the buffer, the length, right? Uh, dir in, dir len, and then dir out and pout dir. So we'll just do this. We're setting them into invalid pointers such that we can identify um, when they, uh, such that we can identify when they do invalid things. Okay. Oh, do we need to set up any globals or anything? Cause that's not looking great. <laughs> let's let's take a look at this. I bet there's a global I need to mark as initialized. Oh nope, that's oh 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 no. <laughs> oh, we got a we got a stack one too. What the fuck? How are we gonna even look at this? How are we gonna filter this down? Fuck! There's so many! I mean, clearly we just arbitrarily control an offset, don't we? <laughs> oh no. Oh no. What? Oh, yep. Island, uh, oh no. Where does it use it though? <laughs> Fuck, I'm gonna need to filter this down. I might need to, um. Like. Oh my god. Yeah, okay, so... There's a bunch of fucking crashes in here. And how are we gonna filter this shit? So... Oh, I lost power again. Oh, we good. We good. <laughs> we got it back. That's some resilient, resilient power going. Um, <laughs> God damn it. So, what do we want to do here? Uh, let's go into, uh, this is a folk ale source aisle session problem. And crash, report crashes. Um, and basically we need to reduce, we need to cut down on state space. Um, we need to cut down on the state space here. So, crash key.
enter your inserts, crash name. Um, oh, this is a really hard problem. Um, MME fault. Like, I, I mean, so this is, this is, right, we can do this. Oh, yeah, and we need to have that hash. Not that it matters. So it should cut down. I think I have to make the crashes directory. I don't remember. Yeah, okay, so now this is kind of based on uh, PC. So we've got like, we've got a crash and puts, we've got an execute of zero, that's going to be uh, returning back on the stack, I would imagine. That's probably the return address. Yeah, I think that one's fine. Um, we didn't set up a return address, I think. Oh boy, did we set up a return address? No, we didn't. Okay, um, so that's fine. So that's uh, returning back. Got an access fault on that. These crashes, of course. Those are... Oh, they're not actually null DRFs. They just look like they are. Got a mem compare crash. All read faults so far. I don't know. There might not be any bugs in it. We probably actually have to fix bugs if we want to find more bugs. <laughs> like, literally, we're probably not making it past some of these. Like, we've literally never made a, a valid enough file. Could cover 636. I thought we had more uh, last run. Let's take a look. Oh, there's a... Uh, where are the Nessies at? 636? Is that it? No more bugs? I think we're literally getting stuck. I think we're actually at a point where we are not getting execution past a certain point. Let's take a look. Mm. Oh no. Not looking good. Okay. Is that... F We're missing coverage on just this. Um, it's obj dump. Oh, I wonder if I'm hitting another end condition. I think I print uh, info on traps. Yeah, I should. Okay, so we're hitting that stuff. 
Hitting that. Test bite order. That's basically... Doing some weird shit. Dir search. User cert from this. Oh, we're hitting stuff. X509 cert parse. Oh, okay. We're missing everything. Oh, look at that. We nested and we got a new crash. A mem compare. Look at that. Easy Nessie. Big Nessie. <laughs> I bet we burst through this now. No. That's not where we Nessied. Have we never made it through this function without crashing? Uh, puts, of course, is crashing. Maybe I need puts? No, that's just a message. So I'm getting stuck here. Copy address. Control Shift A. <laughs> I didn't actually uh, want to learn Rust until I read your bio. Dude, Rust is fucking amazing, man. It's so fucking good. Dude, I am all about Rust. Okay, why are we not making it past that point? What's going on here? Fuck. Fuck. Dude, why is Benjin not showing me addresses? There we go. Thank you. Oh, I lost my place. Yeah, we're missing so much. We literally have never made it past this mem compare. This mem compare has unconditionally crashed. Ah! Oh man. I was <laughs> I was fucking right. We literally can't get past this mem compare because it only ever crashes. Uh it's probably comparing with a global. I probably need to mark some globals as uh readable. Let me do that quick. Let's, uh... Oh, shit. Globals are readable. Um... I need to learn C and C++, but I'd like... I, I like the sound of Rust. Yeah, Rust is amazing. Do it, but... Composer doesn't write Python that writes Rust. I, we've done that a couple times, haven't we? Oh, man. So we've never seen this side. And what is this side? 11F28. Uh, let's just move that shit over here. Uh, um, 11F28. Let's take a squiz. Uh, oh, shit. Dash L. There we go. Uh, what? Asinine.
This is the wrong way out. We'll get there. I, I promise. We'll, we'll, we'll figure this out together. We'll uh, go into the correct folder and, and use tools in very basic ways such that we can actually view the disassembly. Jesus. Uh, 1072. Okay, we've never made it to the next certs. Um, okay, so P7B cert parse. So the first thing we do is we parse a cert, which is here. Let's see how we're doing on this coverage. Uh, init, obj, obj search. Coverage looks okay. Um, search, coverage looks okay, and then stringder looks uh, reasonable there. It doesn't really look like this does shit. Oh, I don't have C tags. Uh, let's go get C tags quick. Shit. Emerge C tags. What you got for me? What C tags is that? Um. There's got to be a better way to get the info. That's clearly not what I wanted. Um, I want uh, universal C tags. Hmm. Exuberant C tags? Let's, uh, what if we do this first? I'm curious what the default uh, C tags is, but I kind of want the power. Let's just turn this on. I'm guessing nothing shows up. None. Okay. Um... We'll just do the default C tags and we'll just try it out, see what it looks like. It's probably exuberant C tags. It's fine for C. It's universal C tags. Well, I'll be damned. I'm impressed. Uh... Okay, so we go into P7B parse. Is this literally searching? Okay, okay, so why are we not getting to the juicy code here? Uh, what's this gating? This uh, a 1160 C. This is gating a 762. 
Um, we've never seen a matching algorithm. Um... And how do we change those? If it's not null, can't be. What? Oh, maybe it's just not being used in that way. Yeah, it's passing a null for those. Ah, so there's nothing we can do about that. Shit. Huh. And does that mean we're coming back and not actually hitting anything? So how is that supposed to parse a fucking cert? So there's some stuff that executes in here. It recurses. <laughs> there's so many bugs. <laughs> there's so many fucking bugs. Ooh, bam! That's our first write bug. <laughs> Hell yeah. 10968. Store D word. Let's try it. Clang, uh, F sanitize address. Um, Clang, F sanitize address. Oh, are writes treated differently than reads? Yes. Okay, so if we get a read and write, well, we can't really get a read and write at the same address on uh, this architecture. Risk five. ASAN. So we're gonna do uh, int arg c char arg v. Uh, if argc is not equal to 2, return negative 1. Uh, int fd is open, argv1, o read only. If fd is negative 1, pair, open, error, uh, return negative 1. Uh, good enough. Uh, uh, S size T le uh, uh, char buff is malloc uh, that much. No, we want to get the length of it, so we want to do uh, um. How do we want to do this? Include F and uh, How control uh, sysstat will do. Okay, and then uh, <laughs> it's been a while. It's been a while. Struct stat, stat, uh, F stat. Uh, F stat, FD stat, 
Mm, char buff is Malik uh, stat ST size. If not buff, return negative one. I don't know. I'm fine. It's fine. The code looks like shit. This reading a file fucking blows in this language. S size T len is equal to read FD into buff for uh, stat ST size. If len is not equal to stat ST size, return negative one. Mm-hmm. Buff stat ST size. Int outline. Mm, that's not a pointer. Uh, include standard lib.h. What else do you not like? Uh, I don't like foo in here. Mm, char. Foo is one. Ah, char foo is malik one. Make sure ASAN knows the size of that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, uh, technically include standard io dot h. Uh, unsigned, unsigned char star foo. Look at that. Uh, scoop R. You got more crash? Oh, we got another crash! Oh, we got a. Oh! Oh! There we go! It's some execute crashes! Uh oh! We're jumping to execute the buffer! Oh no! That's not good! <laughs> uh oh! <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's see if they repro. Let's see. Let's start with. Uh, let's start with this. Mm, this one might not be a real crash. Uh, memory leak. Uh, we need to shut this up. And to shut this up, we need to uh, do this. Um, uh, close FD. Uh, free buff. I know it looks like shit. I'm actually kind of intentionally trying to make it look like shit. If not, foo. Uh, <laughs> free. Uh, buff. Close. FD. Return negative one. Just because ASAN's going to get really mean. Uh, free. Foo. Free buff. Close. FD. If we don't do this, ASAN's going to be like, wah. Leaks or something. I don't know. Okay, so... That one, I don't expect to crash. That one's crashing because I don't have puts in my... Um, I don't have puts in... My emulator. Yep. Stack buffer overflow. In Obj Dump. Fuck yeah. So that one was right. Um, what about the 51? Yep. <laughs> what else do we got? There's just so many to pick from. Uh, this one. Is it a right fault? <laughs> Why are we doing this on such a small terminal? <laughs> um... Yep, we're crashing in dir, and we're crashing on a... Uh, is it a right? Overflows this variable. We did it. We did it. Stack buffer overflow. Woo! <laughs> nice. It's a right of size 8. And look at that. We detected a right of size 8. Fuck yeah! <laughs> uh, what else we got? I mean, this one's fun where we go to execute the buffer. It's the stack buffer overflow. Uh, it's the same one as before, I think. Except we just got the padding right where we actually overflowed the return address. Um, 
Nice. Nice. Jumping to the buffer, too. How fucking sweet is that? Uh, another stack buffer overflow. I think all of these code execution bugs are going to be stack buffer overflows. We probably have an infinite amount of bugs. Okay, not quite. What else we got? Uh, and this one was in a different spot, too. This was in uh, string dir. We haven't even made it to the overflow of the mem copy, which is another buffer overflow. Unless we completely misread that code, but I'm pretty sure we didn't. <laughs> uh, oh, that one didn't crash. Interesting. What else? That's the right fault. Those are the execute faults. I think that's kind of all she wrote for all the bugs. We would have to literally fix these bugs if we wanted to see anything. Would that even be exploitable uh, if you don't have some way of overriding the save cookie? Um, <laughs> that's a gray area. Um, in most situations, no, but it's not universal. Sometimes stack overflows are exploitable. There, there exist situations. Um. Just like pretty much every bug, like. All right, uh, okay, I think we found bugs in that library. I don't really want to root cause them, um, to be honest. Uh, <laughs> I would literally need to fix bugs if we wanted to make any progress. What about this heavier one? Do you think we can get this to build? Thoughts that we can get this to build? Is there a make file? Make file am sample. Mm. Um. Oh, this is the compiled thing. Yeah, we don't want that. We want the we want the big state machine Apple one. Is this the one? Lib security ASN one. Let's let's figure out if this is a real thing. Mm. So do they generate this? This doesn't 100% look like generated code. To 2004. Do they still use this? What, why does this exist? What is this used in? Hmm. I'm trying to find like a later date. Is there any reason to believe this is a real thing? Reproduced. Mm. They might still use this. This could, th that could might be uh, a little too real. God, it looks fucking fun though. Simplistic Burr codec in C. 
Okay. For serializing burr. They're encoded backwards. Decoding is done as normal. Oh! Benchmarks? There's benchmarks? That's an off stream target. Yes, sir, Bob. Um, okay. This looks pretty straightforward. Um, decode. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh, uh oh. Is that a fixed four byte read off the buffer? Is that a buffer that has no length associated with it? Uh oh. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Uh-oh. <laughs> um... It doesn't look like it does much. Length. Yeah. I don't know if this one's gonna matter, dude. I don't know if this one's even worth fuzzing. Literally, they don't pass a length to the decode functions. Like, it, it, this, this literally has no way of knowing the length. Like, it, it, it literally cannot check the bounds of buffer. So this is just literally every single axis in here and is out of bounds. So... Oh, boy. ASN1 is used for code gen. I think people use uh, basically a grammar to create uh, encoders and decoders. It's basically like regex compiling. I, I don't think this is even worth fuzzing. Literally everything here is out of bounds. Like... It's... It's not even close. I I don't even know. I don't even know how I could fuzz that. CS oh boy, oh boy, CS three three oh five. Is this someone's third year C project? Oh my God! It looks like students code. It looks like a C++ developer's code. It looks very clangy. Um, oh, it totally is. It's someone's CS project. You can tell because the way they like fucking push it in from the from the command line. Oh. Is this actually ASN1? Or is this just unrelated? I think they just called it ASN1. Looks clangy. Yeah, the, the variable naming and indentation styles are, are quite clangy. I I think that's just a coincidence that it was called ASN1. Uh is this hand rolled? Uh 
Ooh. That's some advanced. That is some advanced for loopage. Um, you're right. I won't fuzz wolf SSL on stream. You you got me. You got me. Input open close. Gets. Oh, come on. You don't have to do gets and sets and shit. You can just have a buffer and a length, you know. Like, you can do that. You don't have to use streaming files for everything, right? Right? Get. Hmm. Get len. Get o. I don't know. This looks acceptable. I don't know, nothing too egregious there. Embeddable forked from asinine. Oh, why did they fork it? Ah, oh, damn it! I was looking for some custom, some custom sauce in there. Damn it! Key value store over TCP. Want to see the Rust TLS on it? Oh, this looks pretty good. Fine penetration test for fine websites. Yeah, crypto stuff's fucking hard, man. That's for smarty pants. It's a German company. Yeah, it looks German to me. Hmm. All right, well, I'm going to wrap up the stream there. We kind of ran out of targets. We found plenty of bugs. I'm happy with that. I actually am going to go apply this to a target I want to apply it to. <laughs> See y'all later, kids. Oh, yeah. All right. See you all around.